<laughs> hey, brother. <laughs> and away we go. You're listening to Live on Four Legs, the live Pearl Jam podcast experience featuring... Mr. Stone Gossett. Fucking camera in the truck. Welcome once again to the Live on Four Legs Live Pearl Jam Podcast Experience. And you're here for episode number 24 as we dive into our first uh, taste of the binaural tour. Uh, this is Randy, and I'm here with Matthew Helbig. Hello, sir. How are you? And I am. I am. I am mine, is how I am. <laughs> Uh, and we're also here with uh, former guest. He's back, Stephen Maytan. Hello, hello, sir. gentlemen. Hello there. How are you guys? Hey, brother. <laughs> hey, brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, now now I'm thrown off track. Uh, uh, been a while since we had you on. Uh, yeah, October, I've, I've... November. Yeah, uh, November is right before the um, the last uh, the big midterm election I was on. That's right. That's right. You were on for the Reading show, so that's correct. Yeah, it's uh, had a lot of content since you you've been on. So uh, glad glad that you can come back and and uh, kind of kick off binaural with us. That's really outside of like early ten stuff. This is really the last one that we've been yet to dive into as far as album tours go so uh um it should be interesting i i i was kind of i i don't know uh looking at binaural sets it's interesting from afar because you see all the songs and you're like okay well they never play that nowadays they never play that nowadays they never play this uh so it looks rare uh but you know the timing and some of the shows you kind of look at them and you're like well that's that's interesting, but um, like what? I don't know. The to me, the era of binaural is is strange because of Ross killed, uh, and because of sort of the hype and the momentum that came off of Yield. It felt like once it hit binaural, it felt like it died. Um, I, you know, there was almost no press for binaural. It was almost like they weren't trying in the same way, uh, that happened with no code where they released who you are as a single. They, they released, uh, nothing as it seems as their first single. So what, what do you remember of just kind of the album coming out and your first reactions to it? Well, um, I, I'll jump in first here. I remember when the album came out vividly because it came out within days of my graduation from college. Um, so I actually went to uh, the local uh, record store in downtown Blacksburg uh, and waited for them to uh, sell. <laughs> they had the album out on the shelves uh, at like 11.30 p.m., but I wasn't allowed to buy it until midnight. Um, <laughs> so I went and, and hung out and just like chilled in the record store for 30 minutes uh, until they let me buy the album and then I bought it and raced home and listened to it and uh, thought it was fantastic. Um, I, yeah, it, it was a little, a little bit weird being down in Blacksburg. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I didn't realize that there wasn't the press around it because uh, down in Southwest Virginia, I don't think Pearl Jam would have gotten a lot of press, you know, regardless of uh, when the album was coming out. So 
uh, you know, or, or whatever was going on around the album. So um, to me, it was kind of just like a, a product of being um, where I was at the time. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think I'm pretty sure I was one of maybe two people that were there at that midnight release to get the to get the album. Um, and then I, th- I, don't, I don't even th- I think the other guy might not have even bought the Pearl Jam album. He might have bought something that came out the same day. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I definitely realized that there wasn't a lot of people down there like super psyched for it. But considering the location where I was, that, that didn't strike me as really all that odd, honestly. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not surprised that that Blacksburg didn't really fall for a Pearl Jam album. That's not. It's not really yeah. the territory, the area for that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, sandwich in between. You know, like No Code was so much different than Yield, and Yield was so much, and then uh, Binaural was so much different than Yield, and Riot Act that came afterwards. It kind of you're going back and forth between albums that really had a lot of press and a lot of people uh, talking about them in Yield and Riot Act and then No Code and Binaural. It felt like uh, a little bit of dead section. That I, I remember almost nothing from Binaural uh, in that time period. It wasn't until way later that I got into the album. Um, it, it was probably the last album that really stuck to me. Uh, you know, I obviously like it now, but back in that time period and even when, you know, I first really started digging in, it wasn't an album with a lot of songs that they were doing live. It wasn't an album with a lot of songs that were notable, but it's, it's one that I think, uh, it has a lot of stuff that people kind of want to bring back nowadays because it is, you know, they are good songs and they are kind of rare. So, you know, now that we kind of see it from afar, we we kind of say, okay, well, the the binaural tour was pretty awesome. So, yeah, I I had um, one other really good friend, uh, Matt Stutterman, um, that I went to high school with. uh, And I I talked to him right after the album came out. He was really my only other good friend that was super into Pearl Jam. I had, you know, friends that kind of liked them, but, uh, Matt Sorderman took me to my first show. He took me to the show at Randall's Island. Um, and then he actually took me to my third show at Jones Beach. Um, and when we talked about the binaural album, uh, he thought it was like a return to form. He didn't really like the yield, uh, the yield and no code stuff as much as he liked, uh, you know, uh, 10 and verses. So, um, and, and Vitology. So to me, uh, you know, the impression that I was getting from, Pearl Jam fans beyond my beside myself was that um, I think I thought a lot of people were pretty happy about the um, the binaural stuff, but I can definitely see where people who weren't in the Pearl Jam, you know, like in like Ten Club people or whatever, um, they might not have heard the, the binaural stuff as much as they heard the, the the albums I came before. It's interesting that you say that it was kind of a, a return to form because. Uh, uh, Brennan uh, O'Brien didn't produce the album. It was yeah. produced by uh, Tahad Blake. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it just had a different sound. I, I actually, come to think of it, I think O'Brien did the, the final mix on it. There was like, there was a mix that was done and then there was a remix or, or a touch-up mix. And I think Brennan O'Brien was on that. So it did have a little bit of his magic on it. But, it, you know, to me different album matt matt what did you have to say uh it's it's funny it's it kind of goes two ways with binaural it does feel like a time where pearl jam almost didn't even exist even though an album and a tour was happening um which i think we'll we'll get into here when we talk about the the show that steve went to this show and uh but at the same time it's kind of a it's kind of when i really started to listen to and 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 figure out what my older brother uh was listening to at the time and i remember you know before uh riot act coming out saying this is this is that band he listens to this 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 album sucks like i don't i don't get this at all this is this is horrible i, I don't want to listen to this uh and it it was it wasn't until after probably after avocado that i really started to uh, fall in love with Binaural because at the time I <laughs> I felt like, like I said, Pearl Jam almost didn't exist, but at the same time they were uh, they were around because that's what, Steve, that's what you were listening to and I, I didn't like it. So yeah. it's a really weird uh, 
uh, kind of uh, uh, time for for Pearl Jam. And uh, uh, spoiler alert, might have given me one of my all-time favorite uh, shows uh, that we're going to do tonight. So uh, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we... We, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I, I'm glad I grew into it for sure <laughs> because yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah yeah because if I hadn't then um, I don't know if I'd even be a Pearl Jam fan to be honest because Binaural was uh, pretty sour when I first had discovered it yeah and, and just just to be clear I didn't think that Binaural was necessarily a return to form I was just trying to you know tell you what I heard other Pearl Jam people talking about to me I, I loved the album don't get me wrong but the the no code and verses uh excuse me no code and vitology pardon me um uh and then yield of course are three of my favorite albums of theirs so uh i i like that they were going for a different sound and not falling into some kind of rut or anything like that um but i don't i hadn't thought that they had lost their form before binaural came along at all you know i think you got to think of the time period here and what the time period was for music and uh pearl jam really didn't have a place among the just rock and roll rock and roll was really changing it was uh you know new metal was popular this was a year that you know i'm sure disturbed and system of a down and uh godsmack and those kind of bands were really taking over uh modern rock uh uh charts and if it wasn't If it wasn't one of those bands, it was just the pop and hip hop stuff that was coming out at the time that was really, you know, starting to push uh, rock stuff off of even mainstream billboard charts. So, uh, which is funny because this is, you know, Last Kiss would be kind of in between Yield and Binaural and that, you know, was one of the, I don't know, last rock songs of that time that, that were able to chart as far as I can tell, but, um, you know, it, it is weird because, you know, all the bands that they were kind of connected to Nirvana gone a long time ago. Uh, uh, Alice in Chains really wasn't doing anything then. I, I don't know if they were broken up or, or, or what, um, Soundgarden had been broken up. So all the bands, the Seattle, uh, scene had had pretty much died so you know then you have pearl jam that that's kind of sticking in there and they're saying okay we still have stuff but you know they're they're just not a legacy rock band like they are now where people are going to be into it no matter what because they have this uh this history behind them they didn't you know this is 10 years this is the, the 10 year point so um and i think i think even some of the other like like al- alternative rock band like REM I think Matt wasn't wasn't reveal uh not too I want to uh, say reveal was like, like 2000 like, maybe 2 maybe or so one? so then it was so then up so then, like like cuz like, what was it like, adventures like, in hi-fi adventures in hi-fi was that was I thought that was like 2000 2001 no I don't think cuz uh, uh, up up was before reveal um, reveal reveal was 2001 so okay, up, so, then, up so then was probably up must have 99. Been 99. And then Adventures in Hi-Fi must have been like 96 or 90s. I think it was 96 because I think it came out when I graduated high school. Okay, I just but, looked it up. Uh, up. Up is 98. So I guess yeah, okay. that, would, that would push New Adventures back. Uh, I know Monster was 95. Oh, actually. So uh, Monster. Yeah, Randy. Uh, New Adventures in Hi-Fi came out a day after your birthday in 1996. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. So, but but even that, like, so that's the reason why I bring that up is just one because I want to. I love talking about REM, but two, uh, it also just shows that like even the like the the mainstay alternative rock bands were going like completely different directions. Those up up and reveal were like very different from uh, anything that REM had done before. I just want to throw out there that Up is a fantastic album and oh. totally underrated. Up is one of my favorite albums of all time. I, I love I, that album. I just want to put that out there for everybody. <laughs> but it's still very, very different in yes. tone and yeah. And Reveal had a lot of really great songs too. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is not an REM podcast. Yeah, but but you, you did make a good point because 
yeah, everything was everything was changing. But it wasn't that these bands were trying to change to stay relevant. I don't think because if they were doing that, then you know what what would Pearl they Jam weren't be? relevant. That's, that's the thing. That's the thing. That exactly. They were doing exactly. Yeah, they were doing what they were doing, and they were you know kind of these acts that you weren't sure what direction they were going to go and yeah. were they going to just kind of fade into the oblivion rem had already they had already made it essentially at that point because uh they had they had more years on them than pearl jam did but pearl jam it's kind of they could go into the you know complete tailspin from here where they never have a, another album that's uh highly uh uh acclaimed and uh that wasn't true that you know people People liked Riot Act and people liked Avocado and people liked their their follow up. So, um, you know, they were able to kind of pick it up, so to speak, after binaural. I don't know. Uh, it's tough for me to say. If anything, they came out stronger. I yeah, of course, yeah. I, it's tough for me to to kind of say on binaural because I I feel like I'm 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 talking about basically what I didn't know rather than what I know. What I did know was that nobody was talking about the album at that time and i that's i that year and around those years was uh were the years that i was really focusing on music and 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 uh seeing what was out there and i just remember not even glancing at binaural at that time when you know especially after loving yield i only knew it because of steve and like i said Pearl Jam could not have even existed at that point because you you just never heard anything about them for what like maybe one or two more years or two you know two years or so so yeah you just have to do what we did and just get a little older and re-listen to it then you appreciate everything <laughs> a lot more <laughs> yeah uh, look you know uh, 18 19 years later whatever it is uh, binaural is a great album and I think people uh, really have, you know, have the fond memories looking back of it and, uh, you know, just from the hardcore fan base at least. I really uh, like the but, idea of it, of people saying returning to form for it too because as somebody that had ignored the album for so long because of having such a weird, you know, taste in my mouth for it because of the time, it's the one that feels so completely different to me because it was ignored. So that, that's a weird dynamic you get there from from the album. It could be exactly what people want and what they want to hear, and they think that is what Pearl Jam is, and then there's people like me who never listen to it, and it feels so incredibly different. And then after after that, like once you kind of pick it up after listening to the other albums, it kind of feels new and it feels fresh. Definitely. And you kind of you kind of get it after a while. So that's that's what I appreciate from it. You're that you're able to you know that that was really the last one that I really sunk my teeth into and I was able to get it after listening to everything else. So uh let's let's kind of let's kind of dig in a little more here. Uh this Greensboro show that we're about to talk about uh it happened it's the third show into this U.S. tour, and it's the third show since the Ross Killed uh, Festival tragedy. So, you know, coming off, I know the, f the first two shows were really emotional for the band. Uh, and I would think at this point, you know, it when we go in and talk about this show, we're, there's not a lot of spots where they talk about the tragedy. I think they, they try to put it behind them. At this point, which is 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 fairly interesting, but I, I have a couple points on that later. Uh, I think I think we should get into more personal stuff because Steve, you were there, so you have a a good ticket experience. If if you're listening to this and you're uh, you don't rem you weren't there uh, in the '90s and the early 2000s uh, where it wasn't as easy to get tickets as it is today, just you know, even after the fact that, uh, of going on sale, uh, Steve kind of explain how you were able to get the tickets for this one. Yeah. So I knew, uh, I knew the show was coming up. Um, and, uh, you know, inter buying tickets on the internet wasn't quite what it is today. So I found a, so the other option was to do it on the phone, uh, of course, which I did not want to do. So I found a Ticketmaster, um, 
like vendor, uh, you know, to, to, to buy, buy the tickets in person. Um, and I went, uh, <laughs> to, I, I think it was a convenience store, like a, like an off brand Seven Eleven or something like that. Um, in the AM, like, PM was that like an AM, PM? Yeah. AM, PM. Exactly. <laughs> it was, a. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking Wawa. It was a, it was a little Wawa. more upscale, I suppose. It was a circle K. No. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, so I went to this like this place. It was in the middle of nowhere in Christiansburg, Virginia, because I was still living in Blacksburg. Uh, this was the tickets went on sale a few months before I graduated, or right around the time I graduated. Um, and uh, I got the tickets, and I, I'm thinking, okay, Pearl Jam, pretty big band. Uh, I'm gonna get there. I'll get there like two hours before they go on sale. I was figuring there's gonna be like like wristbands and. Uh, you know, like people in line up behind me and, you know, I want to make sure I stake out my spot um, and, and that sort of thing. And, and I had heard about the wristbands, you know, through uh, through the, the uh, fan club, I think maybe. Um, so I get to I get to the place and I tell them, you know, I'm here for a uh, wristband. And the guy gives me a wristband and uh, he's like, all right, you're the first person here. You get the first wristband. I was like, awesome. That's great. And then Nobody else showed up. <laughs> it, was, it was just me. <laughs> it was just, just me staring at the guy, <laughs> the guy working at the convenience store who knew how to run the Ticketmaster machine. Uh, and I was still stressed out because uh, back in high school, um, I had a fairly similar experience where I went to the Ticketmaster in Marshalls uh, and to get Nine Inch Nails tickets. And only two other people showed up, so there was only three people total, and I still didn't get tickets. So I was, <laughs> I was still worried that I was going to get shut out of this Pearl Jam show. Um, and then the tickets go on sale, and I'm like, you know, it's like, I don't remember what it was, 9 a.m. or whatever. And the guy's like moseying over to the machine. I'm like, dude, come on. You've got you, you to gotta do this. Like, I don't think you understand like, how important this is to get, these, to get this, like, the machine fired up and going. And uh, he took forever to get the tickets, uh, uh, to get like to get like logged on. It was the like, machines dialing up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh. Exactly. It was like something. Sorry, out, something out of some. We haven't expanded to AOL 4.0 yet. <laughs> Right. It was like out of a like a uh, like a sitcom or some or some sort or something. Like waiting there, like just like looking over like looking over the counter, seeing if he's logged in. Obviously I got the tickets, no problem. I actually got four tickets. Um, you know, all all seated together, no problem. Um, and I was ready to go for uh for the for the show. But uh the the stressful like the social anxiety of trying to <laughs> hang out in this uh, convenience store. I don't even think maybe in the two hours or three hours I was there, maybe like five customers total came in. So it was just, it was just me and the guy, uh, hanging out, waiting for, waiting for the Pearl Jam tickets to go on sale. Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thankfully times have changed where, uh, all that social anxiety can, <laughs> you know, be shared from right from the comfort of your own home so yeah it's, it's all uh, now it's all replaced with uh internet anxiety and waiting yeah it might <laughs> even be it might even be worse yeah that, exactly f5 F- and <laughs> seeing if yeah. you won lotteries yeah it, it's it's going to be bad no matter what you do just a quick backstory for for some younger listeners if you're out there if you might not know Ticketmaster back in the day would set up these authorized dealers in places like Marshall's or Kmart's or CVS or convenience stores or FYE locations, or uh, sometimes they would even have their own. You remember those Kodak places like mm-hmm. in mall parking yeah. lots? They would even have like little kiosks like that. And if you didn't want to call up or if you didn't want to go to the venue, which you also would be able to do to buy tickets, you could go to these authorized dealers and you could try to get tickets there. And um, <clears throat> I think living on Long Island as kids, we've all done each one of those things. I remember our mom calling up to get tickets. I remember our mom going to Jones Beach to get tickets for shows. So if you think you guys have it hard now with, you know, waking up early to go online, <laughs> you, you don't know what it was like living in the 
living in the 1990s on Long Island trying to get tickets for for Nassau Coliseum. It was very stressful. Did you guys did you guys ever do the trick where you would call up like say tickets went on sale at nine, you would call up at like eight fifteen because the, the you know the lines would get would get clogged up too and they couldn't uh you know like you couldn't call through just like you couldn't get through on the internet. So you, the tickets go on sale at nine, so you call up at like eight fifteen in the morning and be like. Oh, I'm interested in uh, you know, the circus or whatever, and they look up the circus, uh, and and you're like, oh no, none of those dates work for me. How about uh, um, you know, Britney Spears or something? Like, oh, like oh no, none of those dates work for me. And they just keep them on the line until nine o'clock, and you're like, how about Pearl Jam at Jones Beach? And they're like, oh yeah, <laughs> oh, here we go. Yeah, tickets for you. <laughs> yeah. And it's and it's 1998, so that'll be twenty five dollars. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> <Wow>. exactly. <laughs> I I don't have a good uh, hotline Ticketmaster hotline story outside of I think it was like some random Sunday, and I, I guess me and my brother saw that the Who were playing at, at Jones Beach in like 2000 or 2001, and it was Sunday night, probably like a month after tickets went on sale, and I called up. I'm like. Hi, uh, tickets for the Who still available? And the guy's right away said no. I was like, you know, it, it, like he had it gotten was, that phone call a few times that day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or just like, dude, you're you're not getting Who tickets. Get out of here. I think that was my first Who show. If it was, it was the one right after, like, like right after Ent Whistle died. Yeah, it might have been that one. Uh, yeah. That yeah, the, Matt, I, th- I think I was there with you, right? And, yeah, we uh, were like the we were the literally the last, the last row and the last seats all the way to the right. <laughs> yep, exactly. Like the uppermost corner. Yeah, great show. Yeah, yeah. Was it this one uh, in Greensboro? Was this an outdoor venue? No, no. It was the it was um, okay. one of the basketball stadiums there. Steve, you mentioned you had an interesting story about when you got there and saw the the crowd. Which might, oh, yeah. play, which might play into the location, maybe, or what I was talking about earlier about just the the time of the band and how <laughs> you know they yeah. weren't really uh, out there promoting as much. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, think a, I think a lot of things had to do with this. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just tell you real quick. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of give you my my breakdown. You guys can cut out whatever this you don't want. But uh, we, so we drove down from Blacksburg down to uh, to Greensboro. Um, and the three people that I went with, I went with the girl I was dating at the time uh, and her two roommates. And they, we drove all the way down there and they insisted that we had to get food before we went to the venue, uh, which was just freaking brutal. We went for like awful North Carolina pizza, which is just unbelievably God bad. Lord. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, because we had to make that little detour, um, we completely missed Sonic Youth. We got, we saw like their last, oh. saw like their last song. Yeah. That was just, that's horrible. Yeah. That was absolutely heartbreaking. But, um, uh, so then whenever we get there, we get, uh, miss Sonic Youth or maybe still, still like the last song or whatever. Um, find our seats, our seats after all that. I like, I didn't go through the fan club. I went through Ticketmaster and all that shenanigans to get the tickets. I went through, we were like, probably like 12th row back. Um, and I don't know, maybe, uh, six or seven rows from the far right side. So, uh, pretty darn good seats, uh, on stone side. Um, I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever had that, that good of a seat again, except for, um, general admission shows that I've waited online for, uh, to get in and then like had to run to the front. Um, these were just, you know, uh, after, uh, Denmark, they didn't have, they weren't having general admission shows for, for a while. Um, well, you, so we were, you and I did have the like, uh, fifth row at MSG on Mike's side, but those were 10 club seats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah you're yeah. talking about, you're talking about general population uh, right. purchase. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exa- yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, you're usually getting 200 and 300 level seats from just the general ticket master stuff. Yeah, exactly. And these, these were on the floor, uh, like I said, maybe 15 rows back. I don't even think it was that far. So uh, pretty, pretty darn good seats. But then one of the things that really stood out was as we were waiting, uh, the show got started pretty late. And I think one of the reasons why it got started so late was because they were waiting for the crowd to get there. And they like, 
never did. Um, the, the, the stadium, it was a pretty small stadium. Uh, I think it was, I think it's mainly used for, um, basketball, uh, uh, college basketball. So it's not a huge, uh, venue and it was probably about 70 or 75 percent full. The, uh, entire upper, upper deck that would be, that would be full at like MSG or whatever, um, that wasn't even open. Um, and then the, the second deck down was, was, uh, not very full. And even, even some of the spots in the actual bowl were, were spotty with, um, uh, with attendance. So, uh, not a really well attended show at all. It's crazy. Like you would think, I mean, back then, I guess I would expect it during that tour, but you know, if something like that were to happen now, even in a place like North Carolina, I, I would be shocked. Yeah. Uh, that a band like that couldn't sell that out. Um, I, re- I remember one of the tours that happened in the last couple of years. I actually ended up, because I, I got shut out of the ones I wanted and then ended up getting those tickets later, but I ended up buying uh, tickets for like a North Carolina show and ended up selling them on StubHub just because I, I don't know why I did it. I had no intentions on going to the show, but <laughs> it was it was like the only thing that I could get, so I was just happy that I got something. <laughs> uh, but um, cool, I like that. You know, twelve rows back is awesome. Uh, yeah, for those that Ticketmaster, I don't think I've ever had. Actually, no, we did have good uh, Ticketmaster seats when we went to Lollapalooza in two thousand three at uh, Jones Beach, Matt. That our original seats there, I think, were just as good as the ones that we ended up getting upgraded to. God, that could be a sh- that could be a show in itself. <laughs> I think we had like like twentieth row on the floor or something. We got upgraded to like second. So I mean, e- yeah. either one would have been really great. And for for uh, Ticketmaster, yeah, you can't can't beat that. No, not at all. So. Um... Now we can kind of kick into this this uh, this show here, uh, binaural and binaural era is going to kick off with a binaural song to open with, and it is a live on four legs debut of the girl. <laughs> before but I'm, I'm waiting for the day for it to happen it doesn't really happen as often lately but um if you listen to it on the album it's not one of those that you think and you know that you say okay maybe they open with this tonight it's just not it's not typical of any band to open with something like this but when they do it it's kind of it's easing you into it and it's it's sort of starting it's kind of grooving out you know um it's a weird comparison, but I kind of compare the song's tempo to get back a little bit. Just sort of that, like, sort of kind of even the whole time. It's it's not, a, uh, get back is not as bluesy as, uh, as this, but um, I, that's sort of how I kind of see the song's progression uh, going out to be. And it just makes for a really interesting opener 
that, I, again, if you listen to the album, you wouldn't expect that that song would kick off your show. I agree with all that. And I uh, really like this opening because it's got a uh, it's got a nice southern vibe for for Greensboro here. I, I like it as an opener, uh, you know, as a whole. But for this show, I don't think you could get any better. Though it's it, it fits the location. I feel. Yeah, I 100 percent agree. Um, I was thinking about it. Uh, before we, you know, over the weekend, as I got ready to talk, uh, talk to you guys tonight, um, how I feel about this song as an opener. And I, I wanted to be able to say that it's one of my favorite openers, um, because I do really like it. But when you consider things like, uh, long road, um, and love boat captain as openers, I, I don't think this Matt doesn't consider long road, by the way. <laughs> That's that's an argument you need to have with them. <laughs> I 100% give you Love Boat Captain, but you lost me on Long Road there. Oh, I, t- that, t- t- those two as openers are just are just so good. I don't think this quite raises it rises to that level, um, but this this is a really really good opener for exactly the reason that you said. It's the it's that like bluesy, ease you into the show with kind of like a groovy tune uh, I feel like type you're of playing thing. Playing to the crowd here. With, yeah, with that's this, that's the sound of the song. That's possibly true as well. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that mostly the this, this song gives off like a club vibe where you kind of said that it's a little bit more intimate. It's in a stadium and uh, it's 70% full or so. Uh, you know, it, it kind of it has more of an intimate feel to it. I can see them opening with this in like, you know, a, a random club in Seattle and having it work and having having the build work. Um like the blue uh, note they go and play at the blue note they open with something like this exactly yeah and it makes sense it's almost it's the whole song almost feels like it's improvisation especially for yeah. mike yeah yeah kind of uh, does yeah you know and I, I guess that's why it works so well as an opener because it's it's just it grabs you with the unpredictability factor yeah absolutely i agree so uh unpredictable somewhat uh so to speak if if at the time uh you know you're not you're not expecting of the girl to be an opener for shows but now it's kind of uh it's it's kind of had that spot in the beginning um uh what's what is predictable is having corduroy in the two hole which uh, here it is um and we haven't we haven't covered it in the two hole for a while all the spots it's been very random lately you know six and eight and and 12 sometimes uh so we're we're kind of back to corduroy's comfort spot where uh you know for a lot of people me included always say that you know once you hear corduroy it's your kickoff to saying i'm at a pearl jam show holy shit yeah, you know, I I take it number three. That's that's my perfect spot. But I like it number two because I'm thinking of the time period here. Uh, there are better songs to go one, two, and then Corduroy in the number three spot nowadays. But this is good. I I wanted to ask you a question because we we haven't we haven't touched on this here in a while. But uh, I was curious if we could if we could play a little bit because. Um, when the guitars kick in after the intro, right before the vocals, it's like getting kicked in the nuts. It is. I wrote down it's the best intro that I've I've ever heard on this song. Uh, Stone and Mike are are absolutely on point, and uh, I kind of wanted to play that intro. Yeah, and if you got if if you think it kicks ass, let's do it. Oh, I I listened to it a few times. I I, I wrote wow. I, I really want to hear it. Sure. Yeah, let's do it. Let's let's listen to that little part uh, beginning quarter right there. They're just super tight right off the bat, and there's a there's a few times in the set where I feel like they are really focusing in on on their playing 
And I, I don't mind it when they get a little sloppy when they're running around and they're having a good time, but the show is amazingly tight. And that was the, the, the first thing for me. Like you said, you know, the, the opener was, was bluesy, a little bit more free and, and it really fit the song and fit the opener. And this was super tight. And, uh, and that that's going to come up uh, a lot more in this set too. So good, good signs already. Tell us, Yusuf. What? Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. With, I agree with everything you guys said. Uh, having I I prefer corduroy as well in the in the three spot just because I feel like it's the most comfortable there for me for some reason. But um, definitely, uh, you know, this is only my second show ever, and it had been a solid four years since my last one. So. Uh, oh, we didn't address that. Yeah, so I didn't realize that this. Okay, so that Jones Beach one that you said before was your third show. That this was yeah. in between. Okay, that yeah, makes yeah, a lot of sense. Yeah. So, um, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't explain that. That's right. Yeah. So this is this is in between those two, um, and then uh, and and like Matt said, to have Corduroy come in to like jar you into the fact that you're at a Pearl Jam show um, was was perfect, especially because. Uh, I just had to drive, you know, three and a half hours or whatever it was to get to, to get to the show. You're kind of like still in that, like driving, uh, you know, not really focused on what's going on state of mind. And this really got you into the, got you into the mindset to, to get ready for a Pearl Jam show. Yeah, that's exactly what it sounds like. Um, you know, I think everybody that, uh, talks about corduroy and talks about listening to it at a a show wants this to kind of pierce them and make them think okay this is this is my moment where i feel like i'm at the show and this is really the moment i can start you know uh rocking out and enjoying this uh and it goes from corduroy here at number two to number three is uh it's a little different it's insignificance at number three uh doing some rummaging through a lot of this uh this year 2000 set list i noticed that the number three song on a lot of these sets is either grievance and it, and it's usually grievance more than insignificance but it's either grievance or insignificance coming out of uh that two spot and i, I find that to be really interesting especially uh insignificance because it, it sort of uh I don't, I don't know. It just kind of takes you in a direction that I guess you weren't expecting. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, part of it too, if you remember, I, uh, mentioned, mentioned my friend, uh, my friend, Matt, uh, saying how he liked, uh, the binaural more than the previous albums. And this was the song that he stated specifically because of that, um, or that made him think that, uh, and it's, it's because it is that, that, um, yeah, that, I don't know if aggressive is the right term, but um, it's it's one of the more rocking songs uh, that they've had when you consider the last couple albums before this one. See, I, I, I think aggressive is good for part of the song, but I think it's kind of passive aggressive because yeah, I think yeah. the ease into the song is a little more, it's uh, a little more wiry. It's a little more, uh, you know, anxious, I, I guess, instead of like grievance where you hit the drums and and that gets a really aggressive uh, chorus when it goes into it. I feel like insignificance is just a little tuned down uh, compared to grievance. I can see that. Yeah. I have no notes. Perfect placement. I <laughs> love I love this one, two, three. I would take this uh, and it sounded kick ass. They played it great. No notes. Nothing to say. I, I think I like insignificance elsewhere. Uh, I think it's interesting that they did it here, but um, I think here, if you're going to go the binaural route, I would have liked uh, a God's Dice. I would have liked Break or Fall, uh, Working Out a Corduroy. I think those are really good good songs that kind of uh, continue the vibe off of Corduroy. I don't know if insignificance to me continued the vibe, but uh, you know, to each its own. That's that's why we uh, debate all this stuff. Uh, so you come off of insignificance and you go into Brain of Jay, and there's a little bit of a, a screw up in the beginning. They get right back on track. Uh, Mike's part in the first verse sounds incredibly funky, and um, they change they change it up live a lot. Uh, you know the the versions that we've listened to lately. I think Mike changes his parts a lot, and I I like the versatility that he has with it. 
I think he just kind of goes off the cuff of what he's doing at the time and and feels feels it out. Uh, yeah, the false start. It sounded like he got a little tied up, and uh, it sounded like he lost the rhythm. Almost like he 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 was playing too fast, and his hands kind of fell off the <laughs> fretboard. There it was uh, it, it was good uh, because it wasn't bad. You know, we we've heard him false start before, and it's it's usually because he gets so excited. So after that, though, I mean, Eddie performs it top notch, and the whole band is super tight on it. Yeah, this is I I don't understand how anybody likes the song at all. Um, I'm just kidding, Randy. I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> <both fucking off>. <laughs> <laughs> I knew right from the start. I'm like, Geez. no, I, I I totally agree. This song, I, I love the song in this spot. Um, I think it I think it works great. And like you said, after that initial hiccup, um, it, it's the version of this uh, at the show is is fantastic. But they could have played it off because that's the way the album starts. It kind that's of true, actually. Yeah. The hiccup. So. If they were thinking in that mindset of like, oh, wait a second, they kind of, but I think they kind of hiccuped in a different way yeah. where it was, they were kind of getting more into that riff and then stopped uh, rather than kind of just that little one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four part, you know, it was a little bit different, but um yeah, this is a really good version of Brandon J. I think a lot of versions we've been doing of Brandon J lately have just been awesome. And uh, if anybody's listening out there that creates set list for this band, the next time that we're at a good old show, this needs to be a part of it. Hint, <laughs> hint, nudge, nudge. Uh, that brings us to number five here. It's another Live on Four Legs debut. It's another binaural song. Don't know the next time we're going to listen to it, so we're going to hear it now. Here's Evacuation. songs evacuation is probably on the lower end of the spectrum of the songs i enjoy off the album i don't hate it at all it's a maybe a little repetitive for me um are you reading my notes <laughs> i sometimes we completely agree and sometimes we completely di disagree so i i never know what you're coming up with sometimes we completely agree with literally writing down the exact same words <laughs> Well, and then sometimes you say something like, I don't understand how people can get really into breath and I want to just kick you in the nuts. <laughs> I stand and, by it. I stand and by you, it. And you should. You should kick him directly in the nuts. But that's... <laughs> anyway, Randy, go back to what you're saying about this song that actually is being played right now. Um, hearing it live, and there's not a lot of live versions of it uh, compared to, I guess, you know, some of the other songs on this album, but it's it's not the best song to hear live i think it's just it's choppy to me uh just dan it dan it dan it to me I, I don't know it just doesn't click it, on the album it's a little more kind of head head rocking head bobbing but this i i think it just it lingers on a little too long i think yeah you and i are are, are about 50 50 see I, I thought this one actually sounded really great and I'm, I'm with you. I don't really love the song because it, it gets pretty repetitive. And I, I did write that. I thought this version was great and it changed my mind a little bit. And I actually wrote that I, I wouldn't mind seeing it pop up more because 
it, it kind of made me see it differently, hearing it played well live. But another thing I, I, that got me thinking about this song, listening to it again, is, and maybe you might feel the same way, Steve, maybe, maybe you might too. Um, so tell me if you agree with this. This Evacuation is one of the Pearl Jam songs, if not the number one Pearl Jam song, that places them in a certain time frame for me. So what I mean by that is that some songs are timeless, some songs feel like a new direction, uh, or there are some songs that would never fit on another album. And Evacuation is so quintessential 1999, 2000s Pearl Jam for me. Like I, like I, this song is so placed in a specific part of their time and history that and it doesn't belong anywhere else but the year 2000. That's how I always felt about this song. Yeah, I, I would I would definitely agree with that. I can't imagine another album where the song would remotely fit. Um, but to, to kind of just make it three for three, I, I agree with you guys as well. I, I'm not a huge fan of it live. It's um, except for the, the little joke that Eddie makes at the end kind of makes it worth it about uh, yes. <laughs> how Matt Matt wrote the song because uh, you know drummers traditionally hate s- singers. Uh, <laughs> Which is I thought, that's why I'd heard it. Yeah, it's vocal cords. <laughs> I thought that was pretty clever, but um, yeah, uh, it's, oh, wait, it's. Didn't he say he's like, oh wait, but I wrote the words. Maybe, but I, but I wrote the words. Yeah, I don't think yeah, too right. much of myself or something. <laughs> yeah. So, but but I I definitely think it does kind of not carry over live um, as well as it does on the album. And I'm not even I'm not even that huge a fan of it on the album to be to be honest with you, but. Um, as far as renditions of it go, I think this one is a particularly strong one. Yeah. Uh, to answer your question, Matt, I, I agree with you that, you know, when you think 2000 evacuation is kind of stuck in that bubble, uh, so to speak. And I think a lot of the reason why is because they don't go back to it live. Uh, you know, out of all those songs that are on that album, you know, what what songs do they really go back to? They go back to Grievance. They go back a little bit to nothing as it seems, maybe thin air once in a while, but they almost, unless they're doing something really special, they almost never go back to evacuation or uh, the one that I really think is quintessential to binaural is rival Mm -hmm. that I think absolutely cannot fit anywhere else, but where it is. Uh, It's such a, it's such a strange song to me that I I almost enjoy it because it's so strange. So, uh, but again, that's another one that, they almost never played it live in 2000 when they were touring for the album. And now you have a, a 0.0001% chance to hear the song. So uh, I think it kind of goes same case with, with evacuation as well. Um, so continuing on with the set, like Steve said, uh, Ed kind of talks to the crowd, says it's nice to be back in uh, North Carolina and talks about Matt writing the next song, and uh, that song, and, and having it hurt Ed's vocal cords. Uh, this gets into Nothing As It Seems. Uh, I like it here. Uh, this is kind of uh, a little cool down spot uh, after a couple of fast ones. And um, sometimes with, between the first verse and chorus, it sounds like the band is a little off track, but... This song can be hit or miss for me live. Sometimes it just can get away with them. Sometimes you get lost in what McCready was doing. So what? How did you guys feel about this version? I, I thought it was good. I I I know what you're saying about that, and and there are a couple points where it, it might get away from them a little bit, but it it adds to the to the eerie feel of the song, and and it is a good spot, and it is eerie. I wasn't reading this as a cool down. It, it's slower and it gets the cool feeling, but with the song coming up after it, it's it's a. I, I felt like this this little grouping was a a different approach to a cool down, uh, a little different than what we would get today. But I liked it. I thought it was really. I thought it was for the most part. I thought it was tight. But I do agree with what you're saying, where it it can sound like it's maybe a little off, even though it isn't. I, I do agree with that. Uh, yeah, the the passion was there. I think the energy was there. It's just sometimes it can linger a little bit. Uh, you know, if 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 you aren't really feeling the Mike's Mike solo in there, 
Uh, you know, there are times where I've heard it where I've been like, whoa, I'm blown away. This is the greatest thing I've ever heard. And then there are sure. sometimes it's just like, okay, it's, it's there. And, it, and this was sort of, this was in between that. It wasn't bad at all, but I wasn't, I wasn't all for it. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it in the spot. I, I thought the version of it was very good. Um, again, it, it was obviously the first time I'd ever seen it live. Uh, and it was one of my favorite tracks from, from the album. So I was pretty excited uh, that we got to we got to see it live, um, uh, and I, it's an interesting because to me the song uh, sort of has like its own it's like its own cool down and ramp up within the same song because it starts off yeah. so slow and then builds right it builds up into that like that um, uh, crescendo at the end uh, that gets you right back into uh, into the the swing of things. So I think it's a great spot for it right here. Uh, to kind of a little bit of a cool down after the, the raucous opening and then get you ready for what's coming next. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, when you think cool down, it's kind of uh, when you're taking transitions from song to song, when you transition from evacuation into nothing, as it seems, it does feel like you're cooling off a little bit. But uh, there's no cool down going from this into jeremy it 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 does progress in itself and it does get you ready for jeremy which that's a really good point i think it really works yeah that, that's what i meant about this being a really cool different approach to a cool down because I, I do like it even though this is a relatively tame version than, than what we've seen uh you know you got a couple bad feedback issues here in the beginning but um other than that it's performed well and uh you know it's a crowd favorite and it's a hit but other than that nothing really to say oh the no chorus first chorus which is always awesome to hear i, I love it when they do that you know what i mean where he just uh he, he does the, the oohs and the ahs through the first chorus instead of uh, right 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 yeah I, I love it when that pops up yeah no that's definitely a, a unique uh version of the song uh and that kind of takes us into a really weird placement for jeremy um as the number seven song in here i i don't know uh, i think this is way too early to hear jeremy i like it kind of uh you know closer to the end of the first set uh it feels like here either you're getting it out of the way or you're trying to prioritize it and I don't know. I, I I guess I just don't like when Jeremy is prioritized. I like when it blends a little more. Yeah, I, I think um, you guys, uh, if you remember from my previous ex uh, exposure to you guys on this podcast, uh, Jeremy is not one of my favorite songs. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> to, to, I think we go back to that quite uh, often. I think that's an understatement. <laughs> to be polite about it. Um, uh, but for some reason, I, I really actually like it in this spot. I think it... Um, uh, I hate to use the term get it out of the way, but uh, when you're still like on the high of the fact that you're at a Pearl Jam show um, and you're still kind of like, like, like you're so excited that anything is going to be good, um, having it in this spot is, is not that bad. Because normally if you, if you have it much later, you're kind of like, all right, I've heard the, um, you know, I, like this is where I want to hear something rare or this is where I want to hear something that just, you know, blows the lid off the place or, uh, you know, something like that. If you hit, if you get it real let, uh, late in the set um, and then, you know, if you're expecting something dynamic and you get Jeremy, you're like, oh, whatever. But that's why I hate it in the encore. Like, yeah. I don't oh, mind God. It. No. You're the oh, end of the first God. Set. Encore Jeremy is awful. Yeah. No, that is a, that is a terrible, terrible call. I, yeah, I agree with you 100 percent. Should not be in the encore. Um, but when, when you get it at this point and you're kind of like you know, coming off the high of nothing as it seems, you don't really know what you're going to get next. Jeremy can't really be that disappointing. <laughs> if that makes, if that makes sense. Uh, so it, having it, it here, sense. It, it rides it out. Yeah. You know, probably 90% of the people there after you're riding it out after nothing as it seems, which I, I like it after that. I think just to make myself clear is that I like the placement after that song, but I think it's smart. I think you could, you could, you could ride out that, that feel and keep it a little slower, but, have it build up at the same time and kind of get it out of the way. You're kind of doing like 10 things at once with it being here. Yeah. I, again, I just, I don't, you know, I, you guys like it in the spot. I don't know. I, I, 
I think it's weird to get it out of the way. Um, I think that it could have. I feel that way about what's coming up next, actually. So I'm, I'm... both of these songs together are just kind of not really doing it for me. I think I think Ed's voice sounds really good and really crisp on both of these songs. Uh, however, placement wise, it's not really my favorite. I think uh, you know maybe for 2000 it's okay, but for 2019. Uh, I would be very disappointed to get these here when, you know, you have way, a way bigger attraction earlier in the set. When you go one through seven or eight, you build a lot more. Uh, you're not building with Jeremy or daughter in those, those spots. Uh, but I think the, the cylinders are really clicking at this point. Once it hits daughter, I think the band is really tight. Um, you know, the first seven songs or so i was a little lukewarm you know they were fine nothing was really mind-blowing but this to me uh daughter was really when the set started to pick up um but again the placement i'm just not crazy about daughter being this early because then you know in the back of your mind that there has to be an even flow section and you're kind of doing two greatest hits section and, and to me it's just uh it's, I don't know, I guess I, a little disappointing. I, I just think Daughter could have gone in a hundred other spots in this set, and it didn't need to be here. I think MFC, MFC should have been uh, after Jeremy. See, I, I, I'm going to disagree with you guys just because um, when you, since you spoiled that even flow is coming, I don't think I, I can. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, such a spoiler. I won't, I won't feel even too, flow is in this show, I won't, everybody. I won't feel too bad talking about that. <laughs> 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 but what, because of what surrounds even flow later in the set, um, I think daughter works, works well here. I think one, especially one of the songs that's on the, on, on either side of even flow. Um, one of those two songs would have, kind of maybe fit in this spot better but i really like the way they i really like the way they did it uh i think it, i just think it works really well and i think it's pretty unique um and that's all i'll say for now we can talk more about it when we get there uh tags off of this androgynous mind uh obviously sonic youth opening up for them and then they do the it's okay tag but it's not in the same fashion as they usually do it they're uh, Steve, what were you saying before? Yeah, the, this was really interesting. I, I could be completely wrong. I don't really know, honestly. But this is the only time that I've heard um, that the where they pulled out a completely separate section of the "It's Okay" uh, song by Dead Moon, um, and uh, it's it doesn't work quite as well in one aspect of it because it's not he doesn't do it as the sing along that he does. Um, with the, uh, the other section of the, it's okay. Um, but I really just really appreciated the lyrics of this part. Um, for me personally, it really stood out a lot because it was, um, I was just graduating. I graduated college three months ago. Um, and it's the, the, uh, I don't want to get off on a tangent about my life here, but <laughs> I wasn't really, I wasn't really sure if I, had, if I had majored in the right thing. And I was I kind of really apprehensive about going out into the real world and, you know, finding out what I was going to do with myself. Uh, and then he, th he sings this part about um, how he wishes he could light the path that leads to a life of no mistakes and keep you from the damage done. Um, and to me, that was just really powerful. Um, uh, and that song, it, the, the really cool thing about that was because of hearing that, I heard I, I hadn't listened to Dead Moon before this. Um, and I had listened because of this, I searched out that song. And when I heard them do the it's okay tag, uh, at the end of daughter at Jones beach, um, that made that even more special for me. Cause I knew the, I knew the song from dead mood at that point, which was really cool. Um, so I just liked that he pulled out that section to me. It was personally special. Um, and I just think it works especially well as, uh, a tag to daughter and then, uh, crossed over with the androgynous mind, uh, tag as well because it's got that it's okay um you know crossover between the two songs i think it just all of that just works together as a package really really nicely maybe even better than the um than the normal it's okay tag that they do yeah um that was all great stuff i i know that uh that other it's okay 
uh, from Jones Beach is is talked about as one of the best versions of It's Okay. I don't know if it, 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 they had three shows, so I don't know if there are different versions of it. Uh, but a lot of people talk about the It's Okay from Jones Beach being really good. So that's something at some point we'll have to uh, focus up on it when when we're done doing all of our other New York shows. Uh, uh, we have to we have to jump around other parts of the country before jumping into other New York shows. But, <laughs> we, uh, we don't want to play favorites here. Uh, well, we, we kind of do. Already we, are. Yeah. we already are. Next 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 week's show is going to be a like a New York area show. So, uh, but that's where that's where all the good stuff is. We can't help it if all the good stuff happens in the tri-state area. Sorry, <laughs> not sorry. Uh, <laughs> No, not sorry at all. You want good stuff? We do it in New York, baby. Pizza, eggs, Pearl Jam shows, New York. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we go from daughter into MFC and MFC third week in a row that we're covering it. It's funny because I feel like this is exactly what we did with Green Disease, Matt, where we didn't have it for all that time and now we have it a lot and we're talking about it a lot. So um, I still don't think we get Green Disease enough, though. I'm just going to put that out there. Well, we haven't done our last couple shows have been uh, pre riot act, so right, you know, we we just got to do more. Next week is going to be riot act, so maybe next week we have it. Who knows? Maybe. I don't think I don't think we do though. To be honest with you, <sighs> off the top of my head, but whoops. Um, <laughs> I don't think we have MFC though next week either. Uh, I think what happened with Green Disease when we were covering it was that it progressed where I didn't really like the first version as much, and then the second version I liked a little more, but still had a little bit of a problem with it. Then the third version was finally the version that I liked. And I think, I can't decide whether it was the second version of MMC or uh, this version that I really liked the most, but I really did like this version. Uh it's incredibly fast. Uh, it's well paced. I mean, it sounds groovier than the other versions, and it's it's tight, and you can tell that they're having fun with it. However, I'm kind of sick of Eddie's little thing he does after the chorus that nah, 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 <laughs> thing. Uh, I'm kind of over that. I was just going to say how much I enjoy that, actually. It sounds like he's chewing obnoxiously loud. I, I don't know what he's trying to do. He's, doing, he's being a car, man. He's, he's uh, revving his car. I don't, get, I don't get car from that. <laughs> oh, no, man, you guys are killing me. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I, I love this version. Uh, the chorus was crazy tight, and Cameron is amazing on it. But Randy, you've talked in the past. The the make or break for you is that you hate to hear this song rushed, and yes, it definitely speeds up after the first chorus. They go they go a lot faster. The verse is a little rushed in the second half, but it doesn't sound bad rushed. It's not like they're it's not like they're letting it get away from them. They keep it tight. Right. That's why I kind of liked it because I'm going back to I guess the first version that we covered of this. Uh, I believe it was the Milan show, and I feel like that was just straight up just rushed. Uh, they had the gas on it the whole entire time, and they were just trying to get get through a two minute song. And this version, I feel like they were all kind of on the same page uh, while going a little faster. So just a different approach to doing the same thing, I suppose. Right. Yeah. I, I just just real quick, I I do like this song fast. I, I like it as not not. Not rushed, like I, I don't want it to sound like sloppy and like they're you're just trying to get through it. But the faster they play the song, the better to me. I I, I think that's the, the whole point. The whole point of the song, right? It is, but it has an aura to it too that it kind of needs to have a certain feel, especially like that post-chorus, that uh, the little riff that Mike plays. That kind of it sounds like you're. It sounds like you're driving and you're kind of driving in, you know, like a two-lane highway in maybe like a desert or, you know, one of those California highways that that's completely deserted. Uh, it just, it has that feel to it where the aura of it is that you need to, when you're listening to the song, you need to go back to that point where you can feel as, you know, that album, when you hear it on the album, you think that you're in the car 
And when it's rushed, you just kind of hear song and you don't get taken back to that point. And I, I think I felt it with this one. I think I felt the aura there. I don't know if you guys agree with me or not. I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. I, I feel the same way. Absolutely. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, after Ed is done uh, chewing obnoxiously loud, uh, <laughs> he says that this isn't this next song is not not one they play every day. It's been a while since we touched up on it, so that's why I feel like playing it. And I feel like I feel like playing it too. So uh, let's go to whipping. <laughs> show stealer this feels like it's it this i think this was my one of my favorite parts of the show outside of uh something that came way later uh it has a tremendous amount of energy there's you know with with the song and them not playing it for a long time there's absolutely no ring rust it sounds like you know they had been playing it night after night after night so I, you know, it's the magic that I, I guess it, sometimes you can bring songs back like that and just have that, you know, lightning in a bottle and, and capture it. And I wonder, I didn't really check how often they were doing whipping after the show, but I would think that after this version, they would want to do it a lot more. I, I just wrote that this is, uh, this is perfect for the, for the time period of the band. Uh, it fits in perfectly in the set. It works really well after MFC. There's a good transition and a pretty seamless feel, and I think it sounds fantastic. That's all I had for it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll second everything about that. Um, the uh, guy that I, one of the guys that I was at the show with, the um, uh, my girlfriend at the time, her roommate's boyfriend was the other guy. The guy who came with us. He actually uh, he wasn't a huge Pearl Jam fan. Uh, he kind of just you know knew them a little bit and. After that song was over, he was like, "What song was that?" <laughs> uh, so it was it was definitely a highlight, um, definitely a highlight of the of the show. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. Man, whipping kind of sneaks up on you sometimes. Uh, you know, we haven't covered it in I don't know maybe seven, eight shows. Who knows how how long it's been since we covered it? But once you get it again, you're like, "Ah, oh, crap! It's it's been a while," and and it really kind of. It keeps you on your toes with it. I, the, you know, it was a, this especially was a really good version. So it, it just kind of sneaks up on you. Sometimes you forget about it. But, uh, you know, when when you realize it's there, you're like, God damn, where have you been all my life? <laughs> uh, Wishlist is coming up next. And a lot of good versions we've heard of Wishlist lately. And we're a little critical of it because we Matt and I don't really love this song. Uh, Sometimes this was not a good version to me, um, and even even with Eddie kind of screwing up the lyrics, I, I just I think the song kind of got away from them, and it sound sounded like they were a little off pace from the beginning uh, of the song, and then 
and not remembering the lyrics of uh, the second verse. I get it. Uh, it's repetitive and you're kind of, you have to remember, okay, it's, it's more of muscle memory instead of like singing. Um, you got to remember, okay, what, what did I wish I was at this point in the song? What did I wish I was at this point in the song? So I can get why he can kind of fumble a little bit and forget where he was. But, uh, you know, to me, this wasn't, this wasn't that great of a version. Yeah, I, I thought Eddie was hilarious on this because he's having a good time with it at the same time. It's one of those times where he could laugh at himself and, and pick it back up. And uh, He says, I'll, I'll get the next one. Yeah, it's not where he forgets the words in this song that's like the first or second song of the of the set, and it's really rocking, and the crowd's going, and the, the band's going, and, and it turns the song into a train wreck. This was, uh, this was not that because actually, Randy even though he forgot the lyrics and he had to pick himself back up, I actually thought this was a pretty awesome version, uh, regardless of that. I thought the band sounded really good. I thought it was full. I thought it was punchy. I thought I thought there was some uh, emotion going on, even though there weren't a lot of lyrics being, being uh, sung there in the second verse. So I didn't really have any notes on the placement, though, because it's 2000, fit it in anywhere and play it. It's, it's pretty much whatever, but... Besides him uh, uh, messing up the lyrics, that were, wasn't even that bad. I, I actually thought they sounded pretty good. Yeah, I, I really like this version. Um, I still don't understand what problem what the, what the problem you guys have is with the song. I I think it's great. It's one of uh, uh, one of the songs I really like to hear, especially live. Um, I hadn't heard Eddie uh, forget the lyrics like fifteen times uh, at this point yet. <laughs> So I thought, I thought I thought that was the little, little part of it was you know was uh, you know unique interesting and, you. and yeah and un, unique and charming at this point still so I really liked it at the time um, now it's kind of uh, like all right man learn the words <laughs> but uh, <laughs> at the time I thought it was fine um, and yeah I agree I I, I think it's uh, for a song that is just a list of things um, I feel like they really they really got the emotional uh, content in it right uh, in this version. There's another song that's coming later that uh, Ed has a little problem with the lyrics. And I'll, I'll get to that because this is actually, I'm glad Steve is on for this version because it goes back to another version of that song. Uh, again, we'll get to that later, but just a little teaser uh, for later in our, our set, not just their set. Um, I really like the transition from Wishlist and a Better Man so uh, I. here. Uh, just... Better Man, you know, in this spot, I think really works. And I think we've seen it in this spot before where maybe I wasn't as uh, big of a fan of it. But the thing is, I don't like when Better Man is in this spot and it's kind of mid-set-ish. And they kind of make, turn it into a production. They turn it into Save It For Later. And it becomes a big encore song. They did it and it was to the point and it sounded really good. It didn't sound like a transitional song. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong note. That was for Leatherman. Um, uh, I, I said, I said, I liked how uh, it just was straight to the point. <laughs> I think that's, what I that, that's funny. Cause I, it almost mirrored what I was going to say about better man. Uh, <laughs> I actually really well. That no, that that's exactly that's that was my point on Better Man. The the only thing about Leather Man that I mentioned that I read wrong was the transitional song. Part. Oh, okay, yeah, because yeah, I, yeah, 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 I yeah, thought yeah, Better so. Man was was fantastic after Wishlist, and uh, of course I think it works well before Leather Man. But I God, I I, I hate these mid set Better Men. I, I really don't like it. Uh, it's not giving me that showstopper feel that it normally does in recent sets. But I guess that's a good thing, like you said. I don't want them to make it this showstopper production of a show and have it be in the middle of a first set. That I think that's horrible. The 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 bootleg mix is fantastic. The straight into the point is fantastic. But yeah, the placement and the straight the straightforwardness of Better Man is not really what we get anymore. And uh, yeah. I, I like it better now, with of course the exception of Wrigley 2016, which in its own right was pretty incredible too. To where it was what what was like number four I think uh, something yeah uh, that just, sounds uh, right Steve I remember you and I looked at each other like this yeah. is not this what is what is this yeah <laughs> yeah this is this is the, the the classic Better Man that uh, 
I, I prefer actually, I, I like it. I like it this way um, better. So I, I, I liked this version of it. Thought the placement was good. Um, the one, two punch of better man, leather man was uh, worked really well. Um, yeah. I think it's great. Uh, I, I agree about that one, two punch. Um, you know, they, they obviously will do this when they do the man trio and they had nothing man with this. This was just, I think last week we had this exact exact thing. I think we might have. Man and a leather yeah. man. Yeah. And then nothing man was way earlier. I have no, yes. Yeah. I have no leather man notes. I happy to have it. I thought this was great. Uh, agreed. I think, um, we've been dealing with leather man kind of late in the set and, maybe encore situations and last week it was really awkward in that encore uh the crowd was just dead for it because it was a b-side it, it just it needed to be switched a little bit that's all it just it's all it needed yeah and it, it wasn't even a big switch i, I we we said it, it it could have been in that encore just not where it ended up right um i, I don't know i i kind of like the, i think that this is the spot for it right here kind of like mid to late set um and i i think you might say that it's kind of a transitional song but in this spot where it is at this show i I didn't see the transitional uh tag with it here no no i felt i felt it worked better as as a transition from better man but right but when i say transitional song i mean like it's just kind of, all right, well, they're playing it, and I'm really... It, it's like how we say setting forth is. Sure, That's sure. a complete transitional song where, you know, you're not really excited to hear it, and it's going to last for two minutes. Just let's get to the next one. Yeah. Uh, yeah Almost no, like a break. Yeah, I don't feel that way about, about Leatherman. I think I think sometimes I do, but in this in this spot, I don't see it gotcha. as okay. being transitional. I, I, that's that's I get it. what I'm trying to grasp at. Gotcha, gotcha. Anything on Leatherman, Steve? Uh, not, not nothing huge uh, at the time. It felt, um, you know, because I wasn't following, uh, you know, set lists and uh, you know things like that, like I do now. So it it, just, it felt like it was something that was super, super rare at the time, um, and that just made it like extra exciting. Uh, the fact that the version of it is really, really strong, uh, I think, just added even more to that. So it was a very, very cool song uh, to hear that night for sure. Speaking of strong songs, I think that uh, the next one is one of the best of the night, uh, and we're going to hear it. Uh, This is probably, gun to my head, my favorite song off by Narl. Here's Grievance. further but this is a fucking killer version of this song and it's a great transition from Leatherman into this uh just hearing that that drum intro in the beginning there's so many good things that that can come out of that it seems just seamless and i think this really worked i think they were really on point with it i think they they nailed the chorus home oh man i i fucking love this song and i wish that they played the song at almost every show 
I, I think it adds to the great timepiece feeling of this set list. It's like evacuation. Like you get a real sense of the, of no. the Pearl Jam era. It it does no. Oh, it totally reads that way for me completely. No, I think I think this is the one of the songs off of Binaural that you can kind of stick anywhere. I don't I don't agree. Um, yeah, I I, <sighs> I I have to disagree with you on that one as well, Randy. I, I yeah, uh, I think I think Grievance is. Uh, I think it works really well on Binaural. Um, it's a, it's a song that I enjoy. It's not my favorite song on the album, not even close. Well, wait, but, are, um, you're saying you're saying like take it off of Binaural and put it anywhere? I'm saying like off of the binaural tour, you know, how, like we were saying with evacuation, they weren't really playing evacuation or rival or, uh, a couple of those other songs off of the binaural tour. I feel like grievance is one that they kept playing. And I, I like hearing it. That that's what I'm saying about separating it from binaural. That's what I mean. I mean, okay. It, it could fit. It could fit, uh, in sets outside of the binaural tour. But the song itself is like placed in binaural for me. That yeah. I, I immediately think of that that time. Like like Okay. Yeah, yeah. Evacuation. That's e- that's fair to say. I think I, I think for the most part, all all of the binaural songs I think are like that for me. So uh, okay, I, I get that. At least ninety percent of them, I think, for sure. Except soon forget can probably be on an Eddie Soul solo. Probably. <laughs> so my only problem with it live though is Sometimes it feels a little too rock and roll and you lose some of the melody and the tightness and the the feel that you get off the album and it starts to get, um, I feel like it starts to lose my interest because I feel like it's not as interesting Uh live. It doesn't completely lose all all meaning live, but I feel like it's just not 100%. This is, I mean, I do really like the song, but I feel like it's not translating as well live, at at least on this one. I completely disagree. Um, I thought this version was just unreal. It's it's like uh, evacuation for me too. It gets a little repetitive. It's yeah. very I don't know. No, I, I disagree. I, I think there's way more angst in this than evacu- evacuation. Is just kind of the same thing over again, over and over again. Yeah, yeah like, no, no, it's, it's he cha- he changes up his his aggression throughout the course of the song. That's why I. I They're completely different songs. I just feel that. Uh, I feel something's lost in the in the live rendition to this one, to where I, I start to lose interest. Yeah, I I, I agree with that as well. It's, it just doesn't have the same, uh, doesn't have the same effect on me, Randy, that it does on you. I don't think it's it's a it's a, it's a fine song. It's good, but um, and, and this version of it was particularly good, actually. But uh, and don't I was going to say, don't get me wrong. This it's this sounds really good. Yeah, I'm not saying it's performed poorly. It's absolutely not. It it kicks ass it's just yeah it's a it's a translation thing i think for me yeah i get that all right um i think i'm still bitter that i i had that that was on my uh that was on my team right uh maybe yeah i think it might have been and they never played it so maybe yeah yeah you took grievance and insignificance i thought i had a good chance they didn't play one of them at least (laughs) i'm just bitter nilch (laughs) (laughs) i i love it um any chance they get to play it, I freaking love it. I think they, they uh, again, I, I got to my head. I think it's my favorite song of Binaural, but, you know, uh, to each its own for for people, how they see it live. So, um, okay, this gets us into even flow. So, uh, it's late in the set, but it still sounds really good. Um, and... I guess it's a little different. I don't. I don't know. Mike sounds a little different in it. I. I, I, I don't know what if I can grasp it, but I think every time it's under ten minutes, it just feels different. <laughs> Maybe that's it. <laughs> it's like, what? What is this? Yeah. I, I don't. I, it's it's so tough to kind of go from even flow to even flow and be like, okay, that you know, what was really the difference between them. Um, um, th- this was different to me, but I couldn't really, couldn't really grasp it. So, so maybe, I don't know. so I, I had a note on it. Maybe it's what you were hearing too. I had mentioned earlier that for Corduroy, I said that they were super tight and it seemed like they were really focusing and I felt the same way with even flow here. They're playing it crazy tight. They're plucking and picking and drumming 
is uh, is super fast with the attack. Uh, it makes it sound uh, really punchy and focused, and uh, it's to the point. But I really love this version because it sounds like they're really concentrating on it. I think that's maybe that's the that's the main feel I got. I was like, I feel like they're really concentrating on this right now. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll agree with that. I think um, uh, this version of Even Flow is one of my favorite live ones uh, for the exact reasons that you that you uh, said. It, it's like I feel like they went into it almost like with a plan of exactly how it was going to go. It yeah. wasn't. It wasn't kind of just like you know. This is where we screw around for nine minutes or whatever. It was, it was, you know, this is how even flow is going to be tonight, which I think added a lot to it. Which sometimes could possibly ruin a song too. Yeah, you yeah. Don't, you don't want to like overthink it either, right? But... Yeah, but it wasn't totally haphazard. No, actually, it was the complete opposite. I thought it was uh, remarkably tight. Right. Yeah. No. This was a this was a tight version here. Um, I was I was happy to have it. Um, and I, I, I like it in the spot in the set because it's kind of, it's separating itself from the other hits and it kind of, especially this isn't really at the point quite yet where even flow is, uh, has made its way to song number nine or number 10 and being very specific in a spot. Uh, so, uh, it, it's, it's nice to kind of see it in other sets uh in other time periods where it can uh, be used and transitioned from other songs uh differently so uh it was definitely a, a fresh version for me um in between this uh it said that they haven't here's another one they haven't played in quite a while and takes a sip of wine for courage i want to listen to it i don't think it was my favorite version of the song i ever heard but i think uh I'll come out of it and I'll kind of talk about it. Good, uh, good God, Randy. I really hope it wasn't the favorite version of this song you've ever heard. No, it wasn't close. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to. I'm, I'm being nice. Uh, but I I love the song, so I don't want to insult the song's uh, intelligence, so to speak. Um, all right. Uh, get Before getting into it, just know that this is the second time that Matt Cameron had ever played it live. Uh, they played it once on the Yield Tour when he was uh, a fill-in for Jack, and it had a 63-show delay before playing it at this night. Here's In My Tree. Up here in my tree intro that Cameron has almost never played the song I don't I don't know what to tell you because it it sounds completely off and Ed it throws Ed for a loop I feel like Ed kind of is an octave a little too high I, I'm not I'm not sure uh, but I, I, yeah I've heard way better versions of this song uh, I'm going to stick up for Cameron right here, and I'm going to say <laughs> that his drumming has nothing to do with Eddie being completely off-key. His, uh, 
it is this is this is because they haven't played it and this spot is terrible and i think it's because they haven't played it i i don't think they know where to put it and they put it here and i think that was the beginning of the downfall first was horrible placement but then when eddie opens up his voice when the whole band comes in i feel like he could he could hear himself and he could hear the note he could hear what key he's supposed to be in but it's a, it's a cool thing to have this performance come up because it's it's fun to be able to hear and cover a song that they're bringing back for the first time in a while. And yeah, it sounds really bad, but that's kind of what makes this fun is to be able to get performances like that. And I wanted to bring up um, the Live at the Garden DVD, which is like... A, that, that's the quintessential in my trade. It's version. like one of the most amazing versions of any song ever performed. And the reason why it's so good is because, you know, that, that was a while ago. Eddie doesn't need to do this now. Eddie sings it fine now because he, he knows his key, but he's playing the guitar for that intro. And he sings along with the guitar because he could hear it fine and he knows what he's playing and he knows what he's singing. I don't like that because the intro is supposed to be Jeff's bass. That's what makes the song is that intro. And here, right. when they're bringing the song back... He can't sing to the bass, and he is completely off key uh, until the guitars come in. So that that live at the garden has has uh, has its pros, but but the con is that it it completely takes out you know Jeff's intro. So uh, I'm glad that that they've worked it out and it's back and it's it's placed better and and he could find his note uh, without having to play guitar uh, in the beginning of it. Yeah, for me, uh, uh, No Code is still my favorite Pearl Jam album. Uh, so getting the song, and this is In My Tree, is one of my favorite uh, songs from that album. So uh, getting this on this night was uh, was especially fantastic. Uh, and the fact that they hadn't played it in so long kind of added that little bit of like, kind of like with Leatherman, it felt like it was super rare and you were getting something that, um, you know, maybe other people wouldn't get. So uh, that made it especially cool, but uh, you're right. It, as far as like technicality and things like that, it was not a great version, but it's still for me. It's because of the nostalgia aspect of it. It's still one of my favorite versions uh, of it, not from the technical standpoint, but just from the um, you know p- special place that it has in my heart, for lack of a better term. I, I'm gonna be honest. I, I thought I could hear it in his voice before the uh, the guitars came in. I honestly thought he was gonna call it. I thought he was going to say stop and, and they weren't even going to finish the song out. They, they did sound check with it. So they were able to kind of get it off and figure it out uh, before the show. But I started to sense this feeling of almost panic in his voice. Like he was really, it almost got him nervous and I didn't know what he was going to do. We've seen that before where that's kind of shook him up for other songs in the set. And that didn't really, that doesn't happen here. No, uh, no, not at all. I, not at all. I, I, yeah, because I feel like he, he breaks out of it once the guitars come in. It's it's only that intro he can't find his he can't find his his note. So right, it, that's the only problem I had with it too. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it definitely sounds different though. Um, the guitars are on point. Um, they didn't really forget it, but the rest of the song, it's it's not something feels different. Not just Matt. Matt, of course, is not great. It's not the best, but. Um, no, he hasn't figured it the out whole, yet. The I whole think song that, that's is, just, is off. When you listen to it and you listen to other versions, it doesn't have the same type of feel. It feels like Matt is just kind of playing his way through this one as if you know he's only heard the song a couple of times. So uh, he's obviously figured it out, and they've obviously killed it live uh, since he's figured it out. But at this point where this is the second time and it's been two years since he's played it, uh, you know, it's, it's a little, it's a little, it's a little tough, but, um, I will give him the pass. I will give him the benefit of the doubt because mainly because this has become such a strong live song during his, his tenure with the band. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and he does well on it. Unlike, uh, like in Moline where Jeff started playing in my tree for the intro of who you are. Which was <laughs> yeah, which, that was which is always pretty funny. So, <laughs> so yeah. Well, I I kind of go back to that sometimes. <laughs> with Matt just doesn't know no code at all. <laughs> Jeff had no excuse on that because he does know. No. Yeah. Right. Exactly. 
Exactly. Sorry, I just uh, I just thought that was funny. I had to bring that up. It is a good callback. Definitely <laughs> a good callback. Um, here's a song everybody knows. Uh, and if you don't, then I don't know why you're listening to this podcast. But uh, Black comes after In My Tree. And um, I, you know, not a lot of notes on this one. This is pretty much how I like Black. It's a powerful version. Even without a, a We Belong Together tag, I think... You know, it's not the most powerful version I've ever heard, but man, this is uh, uh, this is a good spot, and it kind of is transitioning in, into the end uh, of the set here, where we got two more left, and I, I think that's out of most of the places that you can play black. This is probably my second favorite. It's uh, to the point. It's powerful. Uh, it's played well, and like you said, the performance of. Of in my tree didn't shake them because the this black is is done really well so that's all i had for it yeah for for me at the time uh black was uh definitely high on my list of favorite pearl jam songs it's fallen a little bit since then just because it, i guess i'm a little bit tired of it but uh um the the great performance of it was was fantastic to see that night it was really special is it weird? I was just thinking about this, that sometimes when I listen to the song that you would think because it's a color that you would get that kind of color idea in your head. But the color image that I have in my head when I listen to the song is uh, the same like magenta fuchsia kind of color that you see on uh, that. That is basically the album art for 10. Is that weird? That is I just figured I'd break that, that. That is kind of weird. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know why. No, I, I associate the song with the color black 100%. Like, I just, yeah. So it's not necessarily, I don't think it's odd that you associate it with a color. I just think it's odd that you don't associate it with black. I I associate it with 10. Yeah. That's okay. Odd, I could, yeah. I don't know. See, I, Steve, I, it's the, the latter, what you said. I don't. I understand what you're saying, Randy, and now I think I'm going to associate it with with the the ten album art. Up to this very point, I associated it with anything other than the color black. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. It's really not like it's meaningful, and and it, it definitely isn't an emotional song, but it's not a song that <laughs> warrants the name black. You know? It's really no right. <laughs> Uh, black is just kind of, it's, it's just a small, a small part of the song. I mean, uh, well, you know, I, I think a lot of people, I think, you know, black, it it makes it sound so like dark or, or like almost depressing. Like there, you know, this, this, the complete lack of color. I think a lot of people really, you know, connect to the song to where it's actually a very, uh, a happy thing for them. You know, really, I think so. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, every time I hear it live, I, I feel like I'm put into a better mood because I, it's just, I don't know, it's well played and it's, it's not completely drab and depressing. It's, I get what you're saying. Yeah, but the, the, um, the, the su- it's almost the subject matter, though. I, I, I guess you guys have, I, I was uh, going through the, the uh, rigors of high school dating <laughs> a lot, clo- <laughs> a lot, clo- oh, the- a lot closer to the release of the song than you guys were. So <laughs> it's, 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 almost, it's almost like you could listen to the song and when it's played really well. You take the subject matter, but you're listening to it. You're singing along to it. And they're playing it live, and everyone in the in the audience is singing it with you. It's almost as if you could take the the song and completely turn the subject matter into a positive when you're listening to it. It's it. it this might That's be the only really, song where you could you could do that with. That is really interesting to me. I, wow. I hundred yeah. I hundred percent agree with it's you. An, man. It's and an I atmosphere that, thing, and and. Yeah, I mean, I mean that 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 atmosphere at the at the show, uh, you know, at a show when this is being played, I totally agree. But I guess, um, I because I, I had listened to it, <laughs> you know, in different angsty circumstances on the album so many times, yeah. um, you know, I I don't I do not associate it. I don't. My first thought of this song, even you know, to this day, you know, twenty whatever years later, I don't think of this uh, song in the in the um, realm of seeing it live i think of it uh you know sitting in my room um you know going through the pains of you know love gained and lost in my you know 
as in my an immature, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old. Uh, yeah. That's still how I think about it, even to this day. Black definitely is the is the proper color for that. I'm sure if you get into the right mood, no matter how you see the song, if it's the way I see it, whatever, you could still crawl into a bathtub and light some candles and cry your eyes <laughs> yeah. out to it if the mood strikes you. But when you're when you're seeing it live or hearing it live and it's 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 played well and you're surrounded by all these other fans, yeah, like I said, you could almost turn it into a positive and and it's almost like a support group that you're going to and everybody is kind of there and and it's sort of uh i don't know um uh basically like acceptance and and come to uh a conclusion with it and and uh you know it doesn't it doesn't hit you the same way depression everybody kind of goes together and sort of accepts its fate and i'll go even further a little fun fact about about your co-host here um you know, way back in the day, I, I knew this song existed and I knew that there was a song called Black by Pearl Jam. I did not know this song was the song Black that people kept talking about. I couldn't put that together with, with the song. And then I, hmm. I, I mean, I could still remember finding out that this song is actually the one they refer to as Black. But the, the weird real quick uh because we don't want to spend a lot more time on this uh it's already a lot more time than i expected to uh i i don't even remember the f i feel like this should be one of those songs where you re remember the first time you've ever heard it that you know not for me i don't remember it uh, i just really being played on k-rock and and those uh you know those local you know bab would play it sometimes you know they, they'd yeah. hit the alive the even flow and, and black basically and that's that's my memory of it not a specific first time but i remember hearing it with the with the 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 10 hits basically because that's all that's all they would play right i think i think it just everything from the, the like the first two or three albums kind of blends in because i was listening to i was really listening to everything all at once so um it really kind of blends into that time period of maybe a little before this binaural time period and a little uh after riot act that was kind of like really when i started gaining uh you know being into the band but um I don't know. It's just weird. I I can't like I can't picture a time period with it, which is just strange. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's transition out of black into another song that I actually do see black when I hear it um, <laughs> because you're spinning a black circle, so uh, you have to see black. That's more about a color than black is about. A color. <laughs> Perfect. So you know there you have that. Um, I, I like I like this uh, near the end of the set. I think this is kind of uh, you know it gives you a lot of energy at the end going into uh, from this into rearview mirror is the last two. I think a really strong last two that kind of get you excited for more in the encore. And this was an awesome version. I got nothing uh, got nothing else out of it. Yeah, I don't really have much to say about it either. Uh, I like it later in the first set like this, and I I like it better when it's. Um when it's played in earlier shows because now I'm, I'm more take it or leave it, especially live these days. Uh, but this one was perfectly fine. Well, Eddie, Eddie can't hit notes. Yeah, it's, it's so much, it, I've found that it's so much better, you know, I, I think as a full band performance, I think it's so much better, um, back, back in the day. Um, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, this one's fine. So this is a, uh, for a take it or leave it song. This is a take it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, I, I don't have much to say about it either. It was, it was great. And uh, like Randy said, the, the combination of this and then rear view mirror. Now that is definitely something to talk about. That was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, except for that, uh, the intro, Matt, we got it again. It's, it's not that bad. It's, it's quick. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of like when you spin a wheel like on Wheel of Fortune or something, and it hits those, yeah. dun, 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 and it just doesn't stop, and you're like, fucking stop already.
a rocking bridge here. Again, we talk about this bridge often uh, and how much they change it up. Um, did you guys hear a little Van Hill and a little Kinks there? No. No, I missed that completely. I, yeah. I didn't get it You at really all. got me? You missed that? I, I didn't yeah, get it at all. Totally missed it. I, I, I thought I heard it and I, I read it on notes on, uh, on Five Horizons, so... Yeah, apparently it's there. I got to re-listen to it, but I, I did not okay. hear it. Okay. You want to hear something funny? Actually, Matt, remember how I told you last week before we started the show that I had, like, a Pearl Jam concert dream? Oh, is that the one where you, you, were, you said you couldn't remember the dream, so we decided not to tell the story? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I... Yeah, I didn't really... I do kind of remember the dream, but one of the things that, that is coming back to me is that they played... You really got me. Okay. And I don't know why. Um, there were three songs that I specifically remember them playing. Uh, one of them was that. One of them was I Got Shit. And the other one was Alone. I, I, just totally random. And this, this, you know, I'm not getting more into the dream because that's about all I remember out of it outside of somebody putting me in a headlock and me telling Eddie that guy's a dick and Eddie said it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know how it came down to that, but um, my subconscious is definitely, uh, it's hurting my feelings at the moment. Um, back to rear view. Anything, anything else on this, guys? Uh, I had no notes. I thought this was uh, another down the road uh, performance. N- nothing bad, nothing uh, crazy astonishing either. So I, you know, I got to take it as a good performance. That's, that's all I ask for. Um, for for me, I, I liked uh, when, when I went going into the show. I liked Rearview Mirror on the album, um, but this performance of it made Rearview Mirror one of my favorite Pearl Jam songs. Uh, you know, put rocketed it way up the list where, where it remains today. I I thought this version of it was uh, was awesome. And again, I had never seen it before, so that probably had something to do with it. And it was the only show. It was the only song. Um, throughout the whole night, uh, that they had any sort of like lighting effects. Like they might've done like some, uh, you know, like gotten lighter, you know, dimmer and brighter at certain points, but for rear view mirror, they broke out like the strobes and the spotlights and, and it just, it was just like a whole production that you had not seen at any point through the rest of the show. Um, and that just added a little bit extra to it as well. And the, the, uh, um, Seeing that, I think not only did it make Rearview Mirror one of my favorite Pearl Jam songs, but um, it really put like a an exclamation point on the first set that uh, still sticks with me to this day. It, it was one of the greatest endings to the first to a first sets that I've seen. It's funny that you mentioned the strobe light stuff. Um, we talk about it all the time whenever we see a YouTube clip for a show that we're covering from. I don't know, like just about any era that's not, you know, past uh, always, Backspacer. I always say it, man, the Dark Ages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Vi- what was the Vitality sh- Vitalogy show where there was, like, a campfire? Oh, that was with, that was... San Jose, maybe? I think that was one of the first Jack Iron shows we did, right? There's, there's like, a, yeah, th- there's like this stupid little, like, Amish fireplace or something behind him. It was, that was the light show for the entire stage. It was so strange. <laughs> That's the weirdest thing. What? And once the the show, because it was outdoors, once it got dark, was midway through, there was like two little lights. There was like one spotlight on Eddie, and there was another light just kind of, I don't know, in the distance somewhere. And then, and then Eddie climbs uh, a rafter or something like that during porch, and the camera can't even get it because <laughs> you can't see it, a it's thing. just way too dark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they did not care about production in their shows that was that's the one thing i think we brought it up last week yeah we did they just didn't care about it it wasn't important to them they didn't you know if they had a video screen on in the background it wasn't like this high tech uh 3d images and all that crap that other bands do it, they just listen to the music listen to the fucking song there's no problem that's with there's, there's no problem with that either no as long as the band is good that's fine Right, I it's two. It's just two totally different approaches. Do you guys, do you guys remember um, when uh, uh, touring band came out uh, mm-hmm. and they played it on VH1? Do you remember that? 
I don't remember them playing it on VH1. The, no. Like the like the commercials, you know, pr- like promoting that the fact that it was going to be on the show or on the channel. Uh, it was. Um, uh, I think it, I, Randy. I think they actually played it uh, over Brain of Jay because I think it was like the ban in it. Oh, yeah, and it was, it was like they do like the ban in it, and then they would stop, and it was like no uh, laser shows, and it was like ban in it, and like no, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, Excellent. like no, like three D screens or whatever. I don't know what you know exactly what it said. It was like, can we find? Can we find that? Promo? And it was like, I wish we could find it, that. It was promo. like just you know, just music or you know, or whatever, some something like something crazy like that. And then it was like you know, uh, Pearl Jam, you know, touring band two thousand. You know, catch it Thursday night or whatever. I don't remember what the rest of the commercial was, Sorry. but <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, no, I can't say that I was listening. Uh, I was watching VH1 at that time, or really any time after 1997. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I was actually thinking to myself the other day, what's VH1 is still a channel, right? It still exists within the realm of cable. yes, yes, yeah, man. What the hell is on it? Freaking RuPaul's Drag Race. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that was E or something. I, I, like that. I think it's or Bravo. I think it's VH1. Janine watches it. I'm pretty sure it's VH1. Okay. All right. well, that, that, okay, that gets some ratings. All right, that's that's something. All right. Well, uh, I I'll thought t- that they were. I'll tell you right now on VH1. Right now is Cartel Crew. I have no idea what that is. Sounds interesting. <laughs> and then it looks like there's like a five hour marathon of love and hip hop, and then Martin. <laughs> wow okay, okay. <laughs> um all right uh everyone we're recording this on monday if any of our listeners are watching <laughs> martin tonight uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah let me know what episode it is i uh i have to catch up i'm only on season two. <laughs> oh god I, for, for for the record i actually really liked martin i just that was just for, for some reason the last thing i expected you to say <laughs> it was like <laughs> Wow. That's <laughs> the last thing but I was he, expecting to see. <laughs> I, I, I think Martin does come off as one of those shows in, in, in 2019 where uh, if if you're looking for something to watch at 4 o'clock in the morning, that's probably, <laughs> probably what you get. Yeah. Uh, um, this is a Pearl Jam podcast you're listening to, <laughs> anyway, folks. Right. And, uh, end, of, end of set have, one here. <laughs> yeah, we have more Pearl Jam and just Pearl Jam related accessories uh whatever Hank Hill says <laughs> pearl jam and pearl jam accessories <laughs> uh we've gone off the rails um we're recording this like you know late at night too so it's it's getting to towards bedtime uh i don't know about you guys but i i'm loopy and tired right now <laughs> uh Okay, to start the encore is Light Years. We haven't talked about this one in a while. Uh, it's good to kind of bring it back at points. Uh, sounds really good here. Uh, as far as it being in the encore, not something you see too often, as far as I'm concerned. It's kind of a mid set ish song, sort of not cool down, but sort of sing songy in the middle there kind of same spot that you would put wish list or something like that but uh i think it works out pretty well here i like it here i thought it sounded really nice uh i thought it would have transitioned into this encore a little better if something lighter had come before it like maybe soon forget earlier uh but when we get to that i i i have a lot of pro things to say about soon forget where it is so this being where it is i'll I'll take it uh, I don't hate it. I thought it was played really well, so uh, I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, a, a, a great song to kick off the encore. Um, it, it's unexpected. Uh, even uh, I think at this stage in their in their career, uh, it's it, it's not something I would expect to see kick off an encore. I was pretty surprised by it at the time. Um, I thought they'd come out with something a lot more um, a lot more you know heavy for their encore. Uh, so to get this year was was uh, a nice surprise. I really liked it. After the new light years, uh, Ed thanks everyone for everything and uh, coming in such a large group, uh, which I wonder if it's tongue in cheek. Uh, one person he's noticing all night uh, is a guy with a tape recorder out in front, which is fine. He says always supports it. 
but in order to get a good recording, he had to hold it up all night and couldn't put his arm around his girlfriend. So Ed says, give me the tape recorder and I'll put it on stage for you. That's awesome. Uh, and then goes on to say, you actually think we're going to give this back. So uh, I hope the guy got the tape recorder back. We're actually uh, in between recording this show and by the time that you guys get it, we're going to be looking for this next song, the version, hopefully, uh, on the actual tape recorder. But who knows if we're going to get it or going to try. Uh, uh, this is Crazy Mary right here, and it's a boomless Crazy Mary. So we're going to play it, whether or not it's from the bootleg. We'll see. Uh, that's something in the future that I cannot predict at this moment that we're sitting right now. So... Here it is. Pass it, baby. Pass it, baby. Pass it, baby. Like the thunder crack, mercy backed outside the window sill. She dreamed I was flying high above the trees, over the hills, looked down into the house. must have felt really rare at the time because uh this is the fourth time they'd ever done crazy mary uh again pre-boom so it's not you know it's it's not the show stealer that it is but it sounds incredibly different um yeah weird to hear it without keys and almost i guess flatten away because you're you're expecting boom to come in there uh 
but you know, even though it's I don't know. It, to me, it was it was empty, and I, I've listened to the recorded version before, and I didn't feel that way. But I guess because Boom is such a strong presence on it, it just feels it feels a little empty, even though Mike is killing it. This is definitely a more tame version compared to the arena slash ballpark event that it's become but it's nice and tight and it's eerie at the same time still and uh even though it is a little bit more rare or feels a little bit more rare i don't know if you noticed but when they started man the the crowd goes nuts for this as they should yeah like they, yeah i you can you can i think you can feel from the crowd that they know that this is a special treat and i want to know that from you steve if, if you thought that yeah way. i was just gonna say that um the uh the, the cover, their their cover, or the um, the duet, I guess, for lack of a better term, that he did with Victoria Williams uh, was super popular uh, at the time. Like, even though I don't know that was even actually released as a single, but you heard it a lot. Uh, so uh, it was you know, people were were very surprised to hear it, but a lot of people also knew it. Um, so that definitely made it really special. Uh, I was super stoked. Uh, cause I, I knew it wasn't something that they had played a lot. Um, but it, it, yeah, it was, it was awesome to hear. And I just real quick about the, they're not being boom. Um, I, I think it, it is definitely a different take on it. Um, I don't know if I, I wouldn't say I like it better or worse. It's just very different. Um, but I don't, I do think it has a little bit more of that original, um, like, uh, like a kid telling a story with his band, or her band, you know, since it's a Victoria Williams song, uh, like, you know, like, like a little bit more of an innocence to it, uh, that you don't get with boom because boom adds so much power, uh, and such like the, the flourish to the song. Um, but this is, uh, this makes it something a little bit different, um, in the telling of it that I think you, you lose a little bit with boom. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. That's, uh, I didn't think about it in that uh, aspect. Um, reading here on the Five Horizons, I didn't hear it, but apparently Mike is doing the uh, Stairway to Heaven solo. Did you guys notice that? And it gets cut off. That one I definitely noticed. I, I, know, I, know, I noticed okay. it that night, actually. <laughs> yeah, this, this was one where I was listening to the show, but man, sometimes in the encore, I guess... I have some sort of expectations sometimes. So I listen to the beginning of the song and once I get kind of through it, if I'm like, just kind of, okay, th- th- this is, this is what it is. I kind of assume, you know, something like even Flower daughter, uh, that it's just kind of going to end up the same. And then I met that I end up missing it because I sort of, I go and I, I read something on the internet or something like that while listening to the song. Which... You, don't, you don't skip the song, but your brain kind of passes over. Yeah, it kind of skims it a little bit. So I think for the next three songs, I had to go back and listen to the next three songs because my brain kind of kind of skimmed a little bit. I don't have a lot of notes on the next three. Uh, it's Do the Evolution After Crazy Mary, which, I mean, it's Do the Evolution. What else can you say about it? Uh, I will say that this is probably my favorite spot to hear the song. Uh, You get a couple of slow ones kind of out of, out of the way in the encore. And then you kind of hit them back up with evolution. I I think that all of the song choices in the encore, except for one were really good. And I agree. I agree. Yeah. No notes on this. It's a no frills version. It's sweet and to the point. Oh, I I agree. Same thing. It, It was really tight. Sounded good, but nothing particularly stood out about it. Yeah. Uh, evolution is evolution, and they, they do it just about every night. I think I think that this is probably next to Alive, Even, Flow, and Porch as like their most common song in 2018, at least for two, the 2018 tour. It was, it was played every night except for one. Un- unless, unless it's the show that I go to. <laughs> right <laughs> well it, it, it's at least on the set list it, it, they try. it was like the only song that they skipped yeah they skipped unthought known on that too oh unthought known yeah yeah so, well whatever that, that's fine though don't skip do the evolution I, I was saying the night before don't skip sonic producer so also a good point yeah. Yeah. <laughs> both of those shows uh 
don't skip State of Love and Trust after Do the Evolution because that's the next song. Uh, again, I was I, I think the first time I listened to it, I was just kind of skimming through it because it's one of those songs that is just like okay, it, it doesn't really. I'm not listening for a change at all. Uh, it sounds it sounds fine. It sounds pretty good. Maybe a little soft outside of Mike. I, maybe the passion wasn't roaring through Ed as much as I thought he usually does, but that could just be me. That could just be a hot take. Who knows? Yeah, actually, I thought after uh, Do the Evolution, I thought they they didn't really lose any of the momentum or energy at all. I, I, I thought this was a good state, and state has become a song that i could i could take or leave uh, as well it wow. falls into the same category as spin the black circle and i think it's just because i've <laughs> we've listened to it so much now that uh it's it's not crazy interesting to me anymore but it works but, it's it's so detrimental to this podcast that yeah that's why we have guests on every other <laughs> week because yeah. we we have to keep things fresh but but like I said, like I said, when it's like same, same with Spin the Black Circle, when it's good, it's good, and and this was good. Yeah, I mean, I don't have anything specific to say about this version. I I, I loved it. Uh, again, at the time, not really knowing too much about set lists, I thought this was not a song I expected to hear at all. Um, so that made it a little bit special for me, you know, at the time. Um, but I, I just I even now I get excited when I hear the song. I can't imagine not being stoked about having it in a set list. I agree with you on that. Like, I, I don't go into a show ever saying, Ooh, maybe stay to love and trust tonight. But when I do hear it, I feel like it kind of, it hits you in the right spot and you get really, it's one of the, the songs I get most excited to hear once they hit the opening chords. Uh, uh, I, I, I almost feel like when you listen to it on the bootleg, it's again, one of those songs where you can't sort of duplicate the feel the same feeling that uh that you get when you hear it live so maybe that's why when you listen to it on the bootleg it's it sounds fine but you kind of skim through it a little bit because you don't that same emotion isn't there from the first time you only get that one time hearing it live and then the other times you hear it have to be off a cd or cd (laughs) oh god i have a good cd story can 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 i tell my cd story It'll uh, it'll replace Last Kiss. This 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 story will replace Last Kiss. Uh, this is this is our Last Kiss discussion. So, I was listening to a show, uh, a binaural tour show. I it might have been Jones Beach. I don't know. Sometimes I just search for these shows on YouTube and when I'm on long car rides. But anyway, uh, middle of the show, I hear this is getting onto the Throg's Neck, by the way, which is. Frogsnex is probably the worst bridge in New York. It's scary, scary motherfucker. Uh, and I'm getting onto it, and I hear this cackling here. Well, I don't remember what song was going on, but I just hear this cackling. And then all of a sudden, it's kind of like the TV snow. The and I think, I'm like, that's it. My auxiliary cord is shot. Crap. Um, what do I do? So I... I try something else on YouTube and I make sure that it is my auxiliary cord and I listen to whatever show and I'm like, it's not working. My auxiliary cord is probably shot. Fuck. So what do I do? Uh, I look, I don't have serious radio, so I have to find a station on FM. I wasn't close enough to home to get the FM station that I usually, you know, sit myself with. So it, it wasn't coming in crystal clear. So I said to myself, I'm like, all right, might as well test out the old CD player and see what's in there. And what was it? I, I, it was no code. It, no way. I trusted myself. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I knew it was going to be something Pearl Jam or something good. Um, but I don't think I had played anything in the CD player for at least four years. I think CD players in cars usually sound uh, really really good too sometimes yeah, absolutely uh I, I love i loved using my cd player you know back in i don't know 2011 uh when cds were important to have uh my car look i i every time i rent a car every time i go into jillian's car or another car i look and they have like this uh, uh you know this 
digital board and the, you know the backup cam camera and everything and it feels like it's a normal thing in cars but since i've had my car for nine years now uh i i am so set back where i can't you know, I'm, I'm out of it. I still have a seat. They don't put CD players in cars anymore. So I don't even know what a new car looks like sometimes. Um, just as a, 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 a finish on that, on my CD players, uh, story, I went back and I think I went to my phone and I was just like, all right, I don't care if it's not in the speakers. I'm just going to listen to something. So I went back to the original thing I was listening to. I pressed play and it's static i'm like okay it was the show it wasn't it wasn't my auxiliary cord so i was able to last i, I got stuck in traffic that day too so I was, <laughs> I was able to last the the rest of the trip uh with actual content coming from my phone uh and uh that was last kiss so good, <laughs> good talk guys i still i still like i still like last kiss okay good oh. <laughs> i i, do, do. I the only thing I wanted to say about it was that if you think about it, this is like what we call the the wheelhouse era. This is wheelhouse era last kiss. So the placement and the performance, it it makes sense. You know, I can't get mad. Hundred percent. I can't get mad at that. But if you jump to 2018, unforgivable. <laughs> yep, hundred percent agree. You hear uh, that, Steve? <laughs> unforgivable. Wow. <laughs> I I wrote one word next especially because the next song is awesome yeah. uh but yeah I, I do without it don't care um the next song here uh ends the first encore it's uh the binaural opener break or fall and i don't think i've ever heard this in an encore before or seen it placed in an encore in set list so i was very excited when it came up and uh I was really happy at the version, and that's why we're going to play it for you right now, because it's a live on Four Legs debut. <laughs> up because uh this at this time they pretty much discontinued playing alive in their sets because of uh the ross killed tragedy uh which means their set enders kind of became a little more unpredictable so to get break or fall at the end of the set where something like i don't know porch or they weren't doing why go at the time but why go could go here if uh if rearview mirror hadn't been played yet which it had uh uh, Breaker Fall was a really, really nice fit for this spot. Yeah, I really like it. It sounds really good. Uh, it's a cool spot for it. The only thing is, is the intro gives it gives it a, a vibe where it, it feels like it could work in like a number two or three spot in set one. That's where it usually. That's where it that, usually that's where is. It should it's but but here's here's the thing. I don't think the rest of the song fits in to an early spot of the set like that. I think the rest of the song fits in pretty well where it is here. So I don't know. I, I, I think I rather it here. Yeah, I, I like it here as well. And um, it's one of my favorite songs off of uh, uh, binaural. So it was great to hear. Yeah. Just something, di it's something different. Um, you know, I don't know if at the time you're thinking like, Oh, another binaural song late. That's to kind of end an encore is that to you, Steve? Is that like kind of uh, mailing it in a little bit? Oh no, because you usually for this kind of spot, they they would save for a song of high high praise. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I think I mean I don't think it's mailing it at all. I think it's taking taking a little bit of a risk uh, putting it there. Maybe you could say, but um, I, I definitely think it works, uh, and I, I think it's upbeat enough that uh, it feels feels good at the end of an encore. Um, I mean, uh, you know, yeah, if you had gotten something a little little heavier, that might have, you know, set up for for uh, coming back with the songs that they come back for uh, in encore two. Uh, you know, kind of getting a little bit more of a uh, uh, change of pace between the two, but uh, I, I think it works super well. I, I don't think mailing it in was the right way to say that. I, I, I guess what I'm, I, I guess what I was trying to say was like, I don't know if, if, if it felt, you know, that they were doing a binaural song. That's a new album song in a spot where, you know, it's a closer, right. essentially a, a closing set. So you want, Something from ten, something from verses. That that's that's sort of what I was gra- grasping at there. But I I completely agree. It, it works here, and uh, not something that they do very often uh, nowadays. So yeah, to talk about it in this spot, I don't know when we're going to do that again. So yeah, you, you guys you guys uh, know more about the statistics stuff than I do. Did they play it? Did they play it a lot during that tour? Do you know? Yeah, I think they were. I can get you kind of. Uh, so at at this time, Breaker Fall had been. Pl- this was the twenty fifth time that they had played it. Uh, it looks like they were playing this all the time in two thousand, uh, almost every show, uh, even three times as an opener. So Got you. you know it, this is between they have all uh, on live footsteps. You can see like how many shows in between that that uh, they would play, how many shows that they would skip, and and the most here is three. So they're pretty much doing break or fall every, every night, if not every other. Gotcha. Night. Yeah, when I I just pulled up the because uh, I, I couldn't remember the set list from the Jones Beach show I went to off the top of my head, and they actually played it second that night. So yeah, they were playing it quite a bit. That was exactly what Matt was saying. That's the wheelhouse going through going through the later stats, though. It, you know, it pops up every now and again, but it never it can it's been played like once every year. But the most it's ever missed has been like fifty three shows in a row. That happened twice, so I guess that's a lot. So in between like two thousand five and two thousand six, and two thousand six and two thousand eight, it missed fifty three shows. So that, that I guess that considers a lot. But like once a once a year, if lucky, kind of deal. Uh, all right, that takes us into the second encore. Uh, where Ed speaks and he says he doesn't know much about math, but he asks about absolute value. Uh, and it, I don't know, it sounds like a backhanded insult where he's like, you guys, he says something about you guys really don't know much about math either. I don't know if he was insulting North Carolina or not. No, I, I think, I think it was, I think he was saying the opposite. Oh, okay. Because we're, we're right. in, uh, in Greensboro, there's a huge tech, uh, technological, you know, tech, technology uh, population or whatever you want to call it. It's almost like the East Coast. Greensboro, like the uh, Research Triangle is actually in Raleigh, but uh, in North Carolina is kind of known for its, uh, um, it's, it's almost like the East Coast version of uh, Silicon Valley type thing. At least, at least it was for a while. So I think he was referencing that. Okay. I, that stuff I did not know. So, uh, I don't. I didn't know if it confused the crowd or not, but uh, he thanks them for absolute value and says the next song he never gets through without making any mistakes. So uh, he makes a mistake in the first verse, uh, <laughs> like the first like verse chorus part. Uh, it doesn't seem to to bother him at all. Um, and then at the end, um, he messes up the word stiffening and I feel like when you were on the show last time, Steve, when we did the Reading show, uh, he did the same exact thing on that version of soon for yep. that. So this is a common, this is a common issue for him. And maybe that's why we don't see it nowadays. Yeah. And again, it's, it's like, it was the same thing with, uh, what we talked about earlier with wishlist. Like I, I know it's just you and you're playing the ukulele, which is, which is different, but, like it's charming when you mess up the words, you know, a couple times, but <laughs> like eventually it's like, come on, man, you, you know, 
learn, learn the words to your own song. Especially if it's in the same spot every single time. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got, I'm, not, I'm not a huge Soon Forget fan because uh, it's just it's a ukulele song and it doesn't, I don't know, you, Ed's ukulele stuff doesn't really do much for me. So it's just kind of, it's kind of there. I like the lyrics. Um, I, and I like the version. I don't remember when it was, but I like the version when he dedicated it to a, uh, to a 45th president because it made sense. Uh, cause the 45th president is that type of person. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, uh, a national emergency will soon forget. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm with you. I, Eddie's uh, acoustic ukulele stuff does absolutely nothing for me, but I'm all about this. I think this is fun, and I thought he sounded like he had fun with it, and I thought it sounded like the crowd was having fun with it, and it's different. It's normally something I'd say, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm all in on this, man. I, I really enjoyed this. <laughs> one of the few, one of the comments that we got was that they were very excited that Ed brought brought the ukulele out. Yeah. So it's, you know, um, let me get back to the stats on on soon forget here. But I don't. It's not very common, uh, especially nowadays. Uh, only been played fifty five times. This was the eleventh time it had ever been played. Uh, and really, there's a lot of dead space when you look at the stats here from 2006 until 2013. Uh, zilch. Uh, went 164 shows without playing it until they played it in Vancouver 2013. And then brought it back for the binaural show uh, in Toronto, which I believe was the show that they dedicated it to uh, a man that we'll soon forget. Um and now we're we're at the closing spot. And Matt, I think you mentioned it last week that you would love to hear the song as a closer. Was it last week that you said that? I think it was two weeks ago. I think I two weeks. Yeah, they've only they've only closed a full show with it twice, and this is one of the ones. I think I was subconsciously remembering that they uh, ended with it one time. This is the moment that I've that I've been waiting for because uh, uh, Steve and I we actually we were together yesterday. Uh, we were saying why why isn't this fifty percent of the time? It is such a quintessential closing song. It's perfect. It is perfect. Yeah, I I, I agree. I think this is really fun as a closer here. Uh, I want to play it because if we end up ever covering the Alpine Val- Valley version from nineteen ninety eight, then we've covered the two shows that they closed out a, a show with it. Uh, don't know when we're going to do the Alpine Valley show, but we're here right now. We're going to play Smile. Uh, this closes the set. Listen to it and just kind of feel the vibe. It's it's like they are saying goodbye. And it's, a, it's a nice feel.
really th- I feel like if you're looking for a chain change up, throw a little curveball in there, you know, every, night after night. Lead better, switch with indifference. Lead better, switch with indifference. Lead better, switch with indifference. This is a great curveball. I think that they should do this more often. Yeah, I actually, again, I mentioned a couple of times I wasn't really following set lists and things like that, so I didn't know uh, that they uh, didn't end with the song normally. It just when I heard it, it just made so much sense uh, as a closer, and then I <laughs> figured out years later that that never happens. And I just, like Matt said, I just don't. I couldn't understand, uh, you know, why it just seems like such a perfect song to close a show with. I close every show with it. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Right. There you go. It. There you go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The, the words are, are perfect for it. And, and take, you know, take, take this in, into account too. Um, there are no, there are no covers in this. The only cover in this whole entire show is Crazy Mary. And I, I've always said that that's like semi a cover. Uh, you know, really, Pearl Jam is just as known for it as Victoria Williams is. Rand- Randy, but there's no rocking. You, you've, you've gone last kiss blind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the same thing could be said for last kiss as, as what you said for Crazy Mary, too. I mean, by this point. Oh, Absolutely. No, no one's talking about Wayne Cochran or whatever the other uh, band that made it famous. Wayne Cochran was the one that did the rockabilly version, but um, he's got big hair. Uh, but yeah, no rocking in the free world, no Baba, no fucking up, uh, Sonic Reducer, kick out the jams, whatever usually gets placed into the spot. It just, it feels, it feels so fresh. It feels unique. Uh it feels like they should be doing this more often. I, I, I think we're the three of us are in agreement. One hundred percent. Yep. Um. All right, that's our show. That's that's we've closed it out. I miss you already. I miss you always. <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean we're closing out this show. Uh, we still got some work to do. Uh, let's rate it. Steve, start it off. Oof, boy. Uh. I forgot we had to do this part. Um, we do it out of 10? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I think I gave um, I think I gave Berlin a nine and a half, if I remember correctly. So I'm gonna give this one I'm gonna give this one a nine. Alright, that's fair. What do you got, Matt? This is interesting. They sounded great. You teed this up by saying you teed this up by saying this what this is one of your favorites. Yeah so far yeah this is interesting it's it's fun it's it's a show that i would want to see and i really wish i i could see this show uh so uh eight and a half easy wow uh i'm gonna go a little lower uh than you guys i liked it i thought it was fine um i enjoyed myself listening to it i just and and the the best part about this is that it makes me want to listen to more from the time period. It makes me want to listen to more from uh, from binaural. So I think in the next coming weeks, if you see another binaural show placed in there, then uh, you can thank this this show for it. I, there are three eras right now that I'm I'm really hot on, and one of them is this. Uh, so I don't know. I, it just I, I feel like it was fine, but maybe there were other shows that I like better. I don't want to judge them uh, based off of each other, but I also, uh, I kind of want to just give it a seven because I I got no problem with it, but it's, it's not going to be my favorite show that we do. Fair. So, uh, yeah, that's, that is that. Now, Steve, we've been playing games with everybody. Oh boy. Do you want to play, do you want to play a game? <laughs> um sure man yeah definitely of course i do okay so we've been playing games with all of our guests uh where we put a minute on the clock we still haven't thought of a catchy name for this segment yet uh uh but if anybody has any any ideas just throw it out there we'll we're you know we're open to it I can't find my... T- there it is. There's my stopwatch on my phone. Uh, we put a minute on the clock. And Steve, your category is... Name as many 
of the top 25 songs that Pearl Jam has played live. How many of the top oh 25 God. can you name in a minute? So, Randy, you have your stats up there, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to I'll do the uh, I'll do the timing. How about? Okay, that's that works. Okay. So let's give Steve a minute to collect his thoughts. And by the way, there is a cover in there. I probably just gave one away. So. <laughs> okay. All right. So are you ready? All right. Go. Okay. So obviously, Even Flow, Alive, Jeremy, um, uh, Corduroy, uh, uh, God, my uh, daughter, um, uh, Last Kiss, uh, Immortality. No, not Immortality. What am I saying? Crazy Mary. Sorry. Um, uh, Yellow Leadbetter, uh, um, Rockin' in the Free World, uh, man, oh man, uh, Go, uh, Porch, uh, uh, I'm drawing a total blank here, uh, uh, Rufy Mirror, 10 seconds, um, uh, State of Love and Trust. Uh, uh, once. Stop. Did he? Did he get it? He got once in there. Yeah, for sure. Twelve. All right, that's not yeah, terrible. Twelve. No, that's not bad at all. <laughs> twelve to twenty-five. You know, it's funny. All the songs he named, you kind of assume all of them would be on there, right? But you you get you get kind of surprised when you find out that like yeah, once hasn't been played that many times or uh last kiss hasn't been played as many times as you think really last kiss is not on this list not only that but it's also like uh it's uh like i say i i don't want to play these games because i hate being timed <laughs> exactly <laughs> um i yeah last kiss crazy mary and there was one i think immortality were the three that that you guessed that were not on this list um, the ones that I would have never guessed in the top 25 wish list, uh, Son of last I was, exit. I was going to say wish list. last exit. Really? That's, that is surprising. Yeah. That, that's 22. I was going to say the last exit coming pretty far down the list. Yeah. yeah. Uh, deep is 25. Oh, not for really? you, Lucan. Those are, yeah, those are like, Oh, Lucan, the bottom of course. Sure. Five. Yeah. Wow. So. I mean, top five is even flow alive, porch, corduroy, black, Jeremy. It's Batman. funny those coming in over, uh, like I, I, I honestly would have said immortality. To be honest, would have come in over at least one of those bottom five. It's crazy. Immortality is a little lower. That's like thirty three ish. Hmm. So not too far. Insignificant. Insignificance is higher than immortality. Hmm. Can you believe that? Insignificant, really? Yeah. And save you is higher than insignificance. Wow, it's some crazy ass stats there. <laughs> I'm, re- I'm, re- I'm I'm really surprised Last Kiss didn't make it, just because I felt like for a couple of years there it got played at every show. Like I feel like they did it three times each night. <laughs> <laughs> one, one time feels like three times. <laughs> um, and they still can't find their baby. Uh, <laughs> Last Kiss is probably like 45 ish. It's, it's really cool. that low? Yeah. Holy uh, cow. One, uh, 138 times. Wow. So S- Severed Hand has been played more than Last Kiss. Grievance, MFC, Crazy Mary, I Got Shit. Like all those have been played more than Last Kiss. That's, that's kind of nuts. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, all right. That's about that about wraps this up, Steve. Cool. Thanks for coming on again. Um, yeah, man, it's uh, super fun as as always. I really appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll get you on again soon. Uh, what's the next episode? Do you want to do? Let's uh, let's let's tell the the viewers what they can be uh, listening to the next time they hear you. Um, I think we should. Have you guys done many West Coast shows yet? We've done. No West Coast shows. Oh well, then you uh, then we've got to do. I went to uh, two of the three San Francisco shows uh, in oh my gosh, two thousand six or seven or something like that. 
uh, we should definitely do one of those. Those were those were great great shows. Uh, um, uh, we should definitely do one of those for sure. Uh, and Can I we think, do the one with Big Wave? I was just gonna so, say. I was just gonna say. I think. Yeah. I think it was. The, I think it was night two. They played Big Wave. So thank you. Um, <laughs> I just. I just want you to rub it in. Face, so that's all I want. But I just want to get it played on the podcast already. <laughs> it's. It's been a while. Um, what are we? Twenty four shows in. There aren't. There aren't a lot of album album songs. I think. Out of binaural, we haven't done rival, and uh, there's one other. Can't I think, think uh, of it right I think rival was on the uh, sound check for the show, right? Yes, yeah. it was. Um, I think it was the only one that wasn't played off of sound check. Hmm. That you might be right. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, like we don't have a lot of album songs left. Uh, I know that there's one in an episode coming up in the next couple of weeks that that we're definitely going to hit, uh, which is our last song from Yield. Uh, but you know, let's 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 get our stats going. Let's get our stats out of the way. So um, having Big Wave to talk about would, would be would be fantastic. Yes. All right. Until then, until next time, Steve. Thank you so much for coming back. Absolutely. We'll see you again very soon. Awesome. Bye, brother. Bye, brother. <laughs> Bye, brother. <laughs> All right. Since uh, we said goodbye to Steve, uh, we let's get into a story here from another fan that uh, attended the show. Uh, John Turner actually uh, wrote to us on our uh, our post on our page and not one of the board page uh, pages. So he's given us some credibility i suppose i don't know love it yeah thanks john uh all right john says at 18 years old greensboro was my first pj show at the time i thought i was a pretty big fan but how little i knew then i don't have a ton of vivid memories from the show been to about 45 more over the years hard to remember that many precise moments all that long ago but i do remember specifically being about 12th row on the floor geez was he sitting with steve yeah, right? Was that like the exact location? <laughs> well, he, he says he's on Mike's side, so... Oh, Steve was on Stone's Steve, side. Okay, Steve right, was right. on Stone's, yeah. Uh, and most vividly, I can still remember the emotion that came out of me getting to scream, the waiting drove me mad, like I said. Hell yeah. Going back to Corduroy. Corduroy kicked off the rockers in the second song. PJ had been my favorite band for years, but the energy in that performance and what it brought out of me... I didn't truly know I felt until that very moment it signified to me that this band was truly special. I knew right from then that what the band would prove me over the years, over and over to come, that their live shows just blow away every other band's out of the water. There's just no comparison. My only definitive memory of the night is headbanging like never before to Brain of Jay a couple songs later. I had to watch myself ever since then. I thought I'd injured my neck. That'll happen. You got it. Yeah. That's a that's a very real injury. You got to be careful. The 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 brain the brain of Jay brain contortion. Yeah, yeah. You you can't you can't be reckless out there. You got to be careful. Yeah. Uh, stretch your brain before you go to shows, folks. Um, thank you, John. Uh, thanks for for writing to us. Uh, and now let's head to a public service announcement from your favorite podcast host. Live on Four Legs is happy to present a weekly podcast dedicated to the Pearl Jam Live experience. While we try to get ourselves to as many shows as possible, we have only attended a small fraction compared to the entire live history. That's why we need your help. We want to get to know who you are. If there's a live show that you've attended that you'd like to see us cover in our program, please send us an email at liveonfourlegs, that's the number four, liveonfourlegspodcast at gmail.com. We want to know your entire live experience. Did you once miss a flight? Get lucky in the 10 Club Lottery? Catch a white whale? Your stories will help us mold this into the best podcast it could possibly be. You're already getting to know who we are. Now it's time for us to know who you are. Uh, once again, 
you know, just uh, if you have a show in mind, write to us. Let us know. Even if uh, even even if you don't have a good story from it, if you just want us to cover it, anything like we're we're totally open. I think at this point, we're uh, we're we know all the big shows, and we kind of want to strategically place them uh, throughout how we go about this. Uh, you know, we're gonna have a whole year's worth of shows where. Uh, this year where we're going to spread some big ones throughout along with, uh, the shows like, like we did today, Greensboro from 2000. So, it, you know, not a lot of people talk about Greensboro from 2000, but, um, as our, uh, our guy, Patrick, uh, told us it, or told me, he said it was a sneaky sleeper favorite for him. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, uh. That's sort of what we're looking for going forward. Absolutely. We want we want to be surprised ourselves at these sets. That's why I think I, I rated this one so high because um, it just surprised me. It was it was a change and it was different and it was new and it was it was fresh and it's it's all coming off of an album, like I said earlier, that I, I had ignored for so long. So it just feels different. That's what I like, and I think that's what we want. We want to be shocked and we want to be interested in why something is happening in a set yeah for sure um you know we know all the big stuff you know that happens the stadium shows the uh the mansfields and and all that kind of stuff you you kind of you kind of know about them for reading throughout the history and although some of those shows you have to really take a deep listen to 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 really feel uh you know you can't overlook the the greensboro's the the Grand Rapids, um, uh, the Homdals, as we'll talk about next week. Homdal Ooh, 2003 spo- is next week. Spoiler alert, teaser trailer. Yeah, it's Homdal. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. I'm not Homdel. even. I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> it's Jersey. Why don't we just call it the Jersey Show? Um. Anyway, uh, yeah, so write into us if you have an idea for an episode. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, I want to take this moment to thank our loyal followers and listeners. Uh, we've been kind of promoting stuff since August, so we're getting on uh, six months now. Almost almost six months uh, since we did our first show, but really around this time was when we started our uh, Facebook page. Uh, you know, we started, I think the day, day two of Wrigley was when, uh, we started up the Facebook page and just asking people all over saying, Hey, we're starting this up, trying to gain interest. And throughout that time, um, you know, like there's always been listeners. There's always been people following around, but, um, I I think that this week was such a a cool little milestone because, uh, we reached over, 400 uh, likes and follows on Facebook and I just want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in and listening and and keeping up with us on on social media that's it's uh it's cool to see that that many people are interested in seeing what we're doing so uh, hope you guys keep up and hopefully we're keeping up on our end of the bargain we're giving you some entertaining stuff yeah and it's important to also thank the guys over in single podcast theory and over at the porch podcast uh i was just listening to the uh porch podcast the other day their latest episode they had mentions, mentioned us a few times and uh they the did the, yeah they they brought us up a few times uh and uh i think they did elderly woman and and we've had our opinions on that and uh I actually wanted to thank them. They kind of called us out on a few things. Oh, they did. To, talking about the way we used to talk about elderly woman and kind of how we've come around to it. And, and I think we've definitely grown as listeners, uh, especially picking these things apart uh, constantly. We, we we will change our minds and we, we have changed. And who knows, we might go through another phase where we completely change all over again and, and, and we have completely different opinions about it. But uh yeah, so we thank you for for uh, mentioning us, and the Brads mention us too, and we try to mention them as much as possible. So uh, everyone on Facebook listening, and and everyone in the in the podcast community, it's important to uh, to uh, keep this going and to uh, let everyone else know that there are other people out there. 
we have a great group of people that are fans of this band and it's fun to share everything with with everybody out there yeah uh i haven't gotten around to listen to that episode i will listen to it probably tomorrow now since uh you mentioned it. i'm uh i don't know if it's getting released soon but i'm on an episode of uh can't find a better band right uh they do very similar uh his, his name is brendan he does something very similar to porch but he goes album by album uh so uh, whenever I don't know when he's gonna release it, but I'm on once. So if he's going, if he's doing ten, uh, I'm the first guy. <laughs> so I actually listened cool. to I listened to the episode uh, a couple days ago. He sent me the file and uh, sounded pretty good. So hopefully you guys enjoy it, and we'll we'll post it once uh, once it airs. We'll yeah. give him some pub too. Um, you know I'll listen. Absolutely, I, I you're listening to everything. You got car rides everywhere. I got a, uh, I got a real mixed bag of uh, podcasts. I got Pearl Jam stuff. I got murder things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got movie things. I, I whatever, man. Yeah. I, I, I drive too far, man. I need to, I need to keep intri- I need to keep things uh, entertaining me. Of on course. My, on my drives. Of course. Yeah. I mean, um, I got I got my wrestling podcast that I listen to. That's my huge one of my big influences for this show is uh called something to wrestle with bruce pritchard uh it probably one person listening to the show listens to that show and i know who it is um so that one is a huge influence on this show because it kind of takes uh moments throughout wrestling history and it um one of the guys that hosts the show uh used to be vince mcmahon's right right hand man so he okay. has like the inside scoop of what was happening uh, in storylines and why they did certain things and what was happening backstage. So you got like tons, tons and tons of really cool insight in that show. And that's while we're not backstage with the band, uh, you know, it's still historic perspective looking at things from a certain time and, and placing them in, uh, you know, certain spots. That's sort of where we get that from so um also just just to let you uh know before i forget uh, and if anyone else out there is into wrestling a percussion player i play with his name is uh, johnny bones he's one of the nicest guys you could ever meet and he's a kick-ass percussion player he is a a uh, host on a fourth wall wrestle cast uh they call it check that out too yeah and 20 by 20 that's uh that's Pete. and 20 by 20 yes yes they they follow us on twitter and uh, we've talked to them before too so definitely follow them and and uh yeah we we, we like to we got to promote we, we got to promote everyone I got, here. we want to i got one more podcast and this is uh Go for it. sort of past me talking in future tense but i think on wednesday uh alpha Metallica released an episode uh featuring the top 10 their top 10 music podcasts that you should listen to right now and guess who made the cut um i'm gonna go with i'm gonna go with hall and oats you're absolutely right hall and oats <laughs> definitely made the cut on that on an alphabet on a metallica podcast yeah uh yeah no uh uh we 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 actually made his list which is cool uh, a total shock Aurelian uh emailed me about a week ago and and told me that uh the episode was released on patreon i think and uh Okay. And he said that we were uh, we were on it, and that he really likes it. And, and Tom Tom's written written, written into us before. He's uh, seems like a really good dude, and uh, he wants to come on the show. And and by God, we're gonna have him on the show at some point. So uh, um, I'm thinking the show that he went to, we're probably gonna cover over the summer. So uh, I. Obviously, we're recording this on Monday, so we have not listened to the Alpha Metallica. But uh, I can't wait to see what other shows that uh, he's recommending because his his teaser photo had like the Beatles and had some other uh, bands on there, and I'd love to listen to a Beatles podcast for sure. So, uh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. Uh, other stuff, Patreon. Um, maybe next week we get a new Patreon exclusive episode. What do you think? I'd like to try to do it next week. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's going to be VH1 storytellers. 
So uh, that's a really exciting show. It's it's fun, and we'll have a lot of clips to play uh, for sure. Lots of stories since it's storytellers. Um, and again, you know, we have the Patreon account open for anybody that wants to come and donate to our Patreon and put a little uh, back into the show to keep us running, to keep us afloat. And not only that, but, um, you know, once the tours come come around, we can do stuff. We can put out merch. We can, uh, you know, put out parties, uh, you know, meetups and things like that. And those that's those are kind of that's kind of what we're looking to do uh with our patreon donations uh you know give right back to the fans and not only that but we're giving you a really good deal actually you can't find a better deal uh if you donate to us on patreon uh you get a shirt what else do you get matt do you know what else do we get you probably have no idea well I think a big thing is is that uh, uh, people like to suggest shows and 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 this could get you onto the show. Absolutely, this is the this is the way. If you want to come on a show, this is the way. Just sign up and be a Patreon or a patron. I think it's pretty cool. I think it's awesome. Uh, who wouldn't want to talk to us? Who wouldn't want to talk about Pearl Jam all day, every day? We're great. We're better than great. We're good. <laughs> we're really great uh <laughs> fuck us what the fuck oh uh, that's great um yeah and you know what as a, a little added bonus we'll throw in a uh a bootleg of your choice from any show that we've covered so far uh we'll throw that in as well so lots of lots of stuff you get from that uh and you know and a big thank you and a hug if we ever meet you so that's a lot of stuff. Can't find a better deal. Right. And it's all, you know, there's no cap on it. Whatever you want to donate, that's, that's up to your discretion. We, you know, if you want to donate 50 cents, that's that's fine with us. We're, we just, we're just happy you're a part of it. Um, but, yeah, VH1 Storytellers, that hopefully, hopefully we'll get to that next week. That's going to be our next exclusive episode. So, yeah. Um, as for our next regular episode, like we mentioned, Hamdel, New Jersey, 2003. We're going back to 2003. We're going back to a Jersey show in 2003. And this one is special because uh, they decided to kind of do a chronology uh, in their set where they do two songs from every album in order. Uh, so they, they'll start off with Wash, and then they do two from Ten, then they do two from Verses, then they do two from Vitalogy, then I think they do uh, one of the Merkin Ball songs. Uh, I think they do I Got Shit, and then they do two from No Code, then they do two from Yield. So you get where I'm coming from here. They, you know, everything is in pairs, and uh, it should be a really fun listen, and it should be really fun to talk about, and. Uh, I think it'll give us opportunity to kind of jump in and say, were those the right two to play from that album? I think that's going to be probably the the hot topic for every pairing. Yeah. Yeah. I can't can't wait to discuss it. And then there are three albums because it came out in 2003. There are three albums that were omitted. So maybe we'll uh, we'll add our picks. We'll, we'll add our picks. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be that'll be kind of fun. Um any other any other news? Any other any other things? No, no news. Uh, if if you subscribe to us on iTunes, we really appreciate that you go on iTunes, and rate us, uh, send us a comment. Uh, you know, be nice to us, or you know, say nice things about us, uh, so other people can see our show and see that uh, people enjoy the show and they can get into it as well. So just continuing to build the community i suppose but that's all i got you got that's what you gotta do you got anything nope. else no you want to no. say goodbye i'm um, should i get into I, the goodbye I, spiel i, I want to i think i want to listen uh, i think i want to listen to this bootleg again tomorrow but uh other than that i think that's it all right so i gotta hit the go- goodbye spiel same the same yeah, one i yeah. do every show yeah wow. and the set with it all right <laughs> <clears throat> Me, 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 me. So, 
It may be the end. We're here, but not for much longer. And although we may be parting ways, I miss you already. I miss you always. I was feeling that one. I think that might have been my favorite one so far. That was a good one. Yeah. Uh, For Matt and Randy and our very special guest, Brother Steve, uh, and live on four legs with our two extra legs for today. We will see you next week. Bye, brother. Ha, 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 ha.